Network for approving this course. I provide the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Professor Sahu and Dr. Divya because without you guys, uh, it would have not been possible to apply for this course and get the approval. You have done a great job and thanks for that. Especially uh, to, for, for, this, uh, for, for Dr. Divya, I have been in contact with him all the time for many practical issues and, and have been a tremendous help uh, throughout uh, you know, this, uh, this, the organizing and applying and organizing uh, this course, uh, this course period. And, and I'm quite sure that uh, Professor Sahu uh, has been also uh, working in the background uh, to, to make the course uh, successful. So very much thanks, uh, gratitude to Professor Shahu and, 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 and Dr. Divya. Uh, finally, I also would like to thank uh, the participants uh, who have enrolled uh, to, in this course and who, who, has, who have joined uh, uh, today. So thank you very much. Uh, so uh, you remember, basically, or I also remember that yesterday Professor Sahu was mentioning about uh, this Gian initiative. And he mentioned uh, uh, something like that the purpose of Gian is, is also to build the network. So my key takeaways uh, from his, his speech was that it's not just about learning something from a course, rather kind of, uh, you know, build network, uh, network uh, and collaboration uh, about research, about teaching, about future projects, uh, and so on. So that's why I have decided that I will give a quite a bit of a detailed introduction of myself so that you know quite a bit about me and my research activities, teaching activities and so on, so that if you find any interest or uh, that, that, you know, if you find something that match with your interest, you can contact me and then we can discuss more about the possible collaboration uh, opportunities. Uh, so, yeah, so my name is Nazmul Islam. Uh, you already have, uh, you know, uh, probably have, have seen my name. Uh, so I have a, a PhD degree uh, in the area of information systems, and I did it, uh, it from the University of Turku in Finland. And I did it something like 10 years ago, if I remember correctly, I defended my PhD uh, in, in, in June 2012. So the image that you see, this, this is smiling image, uh, it, was, uh, it was taken uh, just before uh, the defense. Uh, so I was really worried uh, because, you know, uh, I will be grilled during the defense, three hours, four hours defense, but I still I try to somehow smile. So yeah, so 10 years old image this is, but luckily I still look like this. Uh, then uh, I have a master's of science degree uh, in communication engineering and, and, and signal processing uh, from Tampere University of Technology, uh, also in Finland. But nowadays, this, this university doesn't exist anymore because uh, this Tampere University of Technology is merged with another university called University of Tampere. And then together, they have become Tampere University. So this has been, you know, due to merger and acquisition, uh, you know, this, this university doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I did my bachelor in Bangladesh. I'm originally from Bangladesh, but uh, I am here in Finland more than 16 years. Uh, I did my bachelor in, in, in computer science uh, from, from Bangladesh. 
Uh, then uh, something about my current roles. So I'm an associate professor at the Department of Software Engineering at LUT University, uh, also in Finland. And my research area or my professorship area, I should say it, uh, like my professorship area is, is, is in digital transformation. Uh, and then uh, in our department, uh, there is a master's degree program called uh, Software Engineering and Digital Transformation. And I'm heading the digital transformation wing uh, of that program. So that's why I have written like I'm head of digital transformation master's program at LUT University in Finland. So if there are some, if some of you are interested to study digital transformation, consider LUT University uh, is one option in Finland. Uh, then uh, I'm also a docent or it is also called adjunct professorship. So docent is more like an Scandinavian term uh, it is only available in, let's say, Finland, Sweden, Norway. Uh, so basically the English translation of docent is called adjunct professor. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor of information systems at Tampere University. So it's basically the same university where I, I did my master's. Uh, then also I have uh, another role uh, and that's uh, a research fellow. I'm a research fellow at the Department of Computing at the University of uh, Turku in Finland. So I, as you can see that I have been uh, in, in several roles, current roles, I have several current roles. So I am you know, quite, quite well, quite familiar with the Finnish ecosystem and Finnish education, higher education system and, and so on. So if in the future you are interested to do some kind of collaboration, uh, do contact me. Uh, other than these roles, uh, I had in the past, I had roles like uh, abroad, like in, in I was there in University of British Columbia in Canada for a year as a, as a visiting scholar. Uh, then also I was there in, in Ireland, National University Ireland, Galway, as, as, as a visiting scholar. And also I was a visiting scholar in Aalto University in Finland. So basically I am here in this academic business for quite a long time, more than uh, you know, 10 to 12 years. Uh, so my research interest, main research interest is about digital transformation and its impact on, on individuals, you know, societies, organizations, and basically how organizations can create value out of digitalization. So those are kind of, you know, my, my main research interest. But then, you know, this blockchain is one uh, that is driving a digital transformation or digitalization. So that's why, you know, blockchain uh, is one of my research interest areas. And this is like blockchain is really very close to my heart also. Uh, then uh, I'm also doing uh, some research on artificial intelligence, especially explainable AI. Uh, in practice, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to use blockchain uh, with these uh, AI systems to make AI systems uh, uh, more explainable or, you know, uh, more kind of, uh, uh, you can govern the system and, and make that process, AI processes more transparent. So that's another my, my, my research area. And then uh, I have conducted quite a bit of research on uh, positive and negative sides or so-called the dark sides of social media. Uh, so that's one major research area. And then of course this metaverse which uh, recently emerged but, uh, but I have been in fact working uh, on this kind of topic like in you know, a social virtual world already eight to ten years ago. But just recently, they have, you know, kind of rebranded the whole thing as metaverse. So, yeah. So this is also one 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 research uh, interest that I have currently. Uh, in the past or at the moment, uh, I had, you know, multiple uh, big projects. Uh, so two projects I would like 
like to mention here. One project is about AI governance and auditing. So this is a project funded by Business Finland and the budget is 4.25 million euros. So quite a big project, this one. And here uh, a couple of universities are there and industry partners are there. So, so the whole project's idea is to how to govern and audit AI systems, how to make the system uh, explainable uh, to the end users and how to really govern and audit it. So I was, I was, uh, I had a work package uh, and I am um, one of the work packages uh, leader over there and this project is, is still running. And the second project is probably more relevant uh, to this is called GDPR compliant blockchain service design and value creation. So I'm the principal investigator in this project. And this project is also funded by Business Finland, but a bit smaller project, this one, uh, something like 150,000 euros project, this one. And uh, we have concluded uh, quite a bit of uh, this project already. Uh, so some of the findings I will try to present in this course. So you will get a uh, kind of, you know, fresh research uh, outputs uh, in this course. Uh, so then a brief about me, like, you know, uh, probably you have understood that my research is very much cross disciplinary in nature. I just, I just don't do only technical stuff, but, but also, you know, business stuff. And that's why the course name is also uh, blockchain for business. It's not just a technical thing, but, but business and, and regulatory aspects should be there. So I, I do, you know, this cross disciplinary research in the area of digitalization and its impact on citizens, organization and society. As I mentioned that I'm a docent at Tampere University and in the, my research has really appeared in really top outlets like uh, these information systems outlets like Journal of Strategic Information Systems, European Journal of Information Systems and Information Systems Journal. So these journals are really top uh, in the field and, and uh, sometimes it takes three to four years uh, to publish one paper and I, I managed to uh, publish several. So, you know, so, so yeah, it, it, it has been a tough job, but, 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 but I somehow managed. Uh, but then I have also published in other highly ranked uh, interdisciplinary journals such as IEEE Access, uh, IEEE Transaction of Industrial Informatics, Computers and Education, Technological Forecasting Social Change, uh, then uh, 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 International Journal of Information Management, uh, Information Technology and People, Computers in Human Behavior, uh, Computers in Industry, Internet Research, Communications of AIS, among others. And I'm currently uh, serving as a senior editor uh, for Information and Technology and People Journal, which is also a quite a reported uh, journal. So if you are interested and if you have some research articles, uh, you could consider submitting uh, to that journal. Uh, then another very important and interesting stuff that uh, in LUT University, uh, I have, I am going to establish a lab called Blockchain Lab or, or in short Chain Lab. And the purpose of this lab uh, is to conduct research and education in the area of blockchain and associated technologies. So basically preparing the future students, uh, future fin students in Finland, uh, you know, in the, in the area of, of, of blockchain so that they can work uh, in the future in the, in the area of blockchain. Uh, so if you are interested uh, to know more about my, uh, my research, uh, feel free to uh, uh, visit website, uh, this Google Scholar page. Uh, of course, you can go to the Google Scholar uh, page and then search my name there, but put an, an, an initial like AKM and then put Nazmul Islam and then you will find my, my, my profile and then uh, take a look. And, and if you find something interesting, something that interests you, 
do contact me and, and we can then discuss uh, more. Uh, but now uh, I would like to know a little bit about you also, but I know that here there are quite many people, so it would be quite difficult to ask all of your names and, and what you are doing. So I have kept a small exercise for you. That's a fun exercise, don't worry. I will now share another screen with you. Just a moment. Here, can you see my new screen? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Uh, now let me make it, let me put it in, 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 in presentation mode. So now what you have to do, all the participants who, are, who have joined today, uh, if you have a smartphone, you could use a smartphone. If you have a smartphone and you have, if you have internet, use that. If you don't have a smartphone or internet, then you could open your browser. And then what you can, what you have to do, you need to go to this website called www.menti.com. Oh, you have already started. Okay, menti.com, you go there and then use this code 11006099. Let's wait maybe a minute so that everyone can join. And once you join, you will see this question on your screen and then you need to answer. So I want to know about your background. Are you coming from business? Are you coming from law? Are you coming from computer science or electrical engineering or other? Okay, we are, we are, we are getting the responses. Yeah, so two computer scientists, one electrical engineer, one other. One business, good. Two business, two others. Okay, so interesting, we have one law, very good, very good. We have quite a nice group here, diverse background. I really like it then, okay. Yeah, business, four business. So it seems that business is winning. Yeah, five business. Okay. Yeah, it's better if you, all of you uh, respond because I have, you know, more questions. Uh, there are uh, more exercises we, we will do with this tool. So it's important that you get familiarized with this tool. So I would request everyone to join and answer. Okay. Okay, maybe maybe then we could uh, go to the next question. But from here, what I can see that we have a diverse group. Uh, we have uh, people from business, more people now from computer science. We have law, one law guy, one law person, and then 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 uh, electrical engineering and others. Okay. Good enough. Let's go to the next slide, maybe. Okay, somebody still wants to want to want to want to uh, respond. Maybe wait. I wait a few more seconds. Okay, but let me go to the next slide then. So oh, now tell me. Are you a student, a job holder, or unemployed at the moment? So a student, we have one student, two student, job holder, six students. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mostly students we have, but again, we have some job holder. So again, I would say we have a diverse group, which is good 
Okay, very good. So again, I can say that we have a diverse group. Yeah. So oh, we have, there is one unemployed. Hopefully, you will learn something from this course and then research by yourself and maybe get some job in the future. Yeah, it will be also useful for you. Very good. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, so we have a diverse group of students job and, and job holder. Uh, let me go to the then uh, to the next question. Uh, what is your highest academic degree? I'm here also. I'm hoping that we will have a diverse group. Yeah, PhD. Okay, so mostly masters, but PhD holder is also there. Two PhDs. One bachelor, two bachelor, three PhDs. Yeah, very good. Again, I can say that we have a diverse group and interesting because you know you bring different different uh, level of knowledge, and I will try to uh, you know conduct this this course in such a way so that you all of you, irrespective of your background, have 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 something to uh, have something to learn. Yeah, so we have bachelor, masters, and PhD. Okay, then let me go to the next slide and mention your three, only three key technical and business skills or research interest. Only three you need to mention. Let's see what kind of research interest or, or skills do you have at the moment? Here, you need to type the skills. Okay, we are waiting for the first one to come. Okay, so someone has said blockchain, innovation and marketing. Good. Accounting, business, analytics, research. Very good. We are getting a nice uh, word cloud out of your Answers, okay, blockchain is still, finance, very good. Tourism, interesting, artificial intelligence. Okay, account, Python, yeah, very good. Innovation, business, auditing, very good. Research, analytics, numbers. Yeah, problem solving. Mm -hmm. Optimization techniques, blockchain applications. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Manpower management, uh, that's also interesting. Programming, yeah. AI ML, yeah, with this, that's machine learning. Power system, yeah. We, uh, I know that there are some electrical engineers, so power systems. Makes sense. Disaster management, also very interesting. Disaster ma management, yeah. So as you see that we have finance people, we have marketing people, uh, we have uh, analytics people, uh, analytics people, computer science people, and then yeah, business is there. Yeah, data science. Yeah, data science is there. Okay. So as you see here also, we have a, we have a very diverse group, and with with different types of experience and and different types of skills and interest. This is very good. Okay. So let me go to the next slide then. How would you rate your knowledge on blockchain? Okay, no or limited prior knowledge, intermediate. Okay, yeah, no prior knowledge, intermediate. Okay, very good. I know that we have. So still, I would say that we have a diverse group. Let's see if there is someone who is expert. Okay, so one expert we have found. Very good. Yeah. Anyone else want to answer? Okay. 
Oke. Okay. Ya. Yeah. Oke. Okay. Ya, yeah, but again, as you see, that we have different types of people who have joined here. So, I would say that yeah, we have a diverse group so uh, and 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 also, you know, my lecture slides have been designed in such a way that irrespective of your current knowledge uh, or current background, you probably will have something as a takeaway after this course. Okay, so then I think this is the final question. What do you expect from this course? Again, three words maximum. We are waiting for the fast response. I know that it it takes a bit time to think. You know, what do we, I really expect? I, I I fully understand it will. It probably will take time. Yeah, learn learn blockchain maybe. Okay. Yeah, learn new 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 things. Learn blockchain. Okay. What else? Technical skills. Yeah, to some extent, your technical skills most likely will improve after this. Uh, knowledge application areas definitely you will you will learn many application areas of blockchain yeah the content has been designed that way yeah okay uh, the, the whole point here is that if I see something that you want you expect and I don't have in my slide I will still I will have time tomorrow uh, to cover that and that is why I, I am asking about it. Uh, then about blockchain application. Yeah, technology skills, conceptual knowledge. Yeah, definitely you will get a lot of conceptual knowledge. Basic understanding, definitely you will get basic understanding. Yeah, programming in blockchain, that, that is something we will not cover that much. Unfortunately, but I will show you uh, some link uh, through which you could explore more. Uh, yeah, in fact, I, I initially I thought that I will I will I will also teach some programming uh, things, but uh, if it was face to face, I had that intention. But but then I I try to you know avoid it. Uh, and then now future of blockchain. Yeah, drawbacks. You will learn about drawbacks definitely. Uh, blockchain key aspects. Yeah, you will learn about it. Blockchain architecture. Of course, you will learn about blockchain architecture. Blockchain business importance. Yes, you will learn about business in, in, importance. Integration with or application mapping in BBC. Foundational view. Yeah, the, you will learn all these things. Okay, so so I think uh, you know my my use cases. You will learn use cases for sure. Uh, so I would say that basically I, I think that you have I I I would pro I would probably cover all, all these things that you are expecting uh, from 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 this. So now I think I know about uh, about you uh, more. And, and based on this, I will try to, uh, you know, adjust my lecture slides and, and, and the content. Now I will go back to my uh, original slide. Let me share my original slide again. Okay, so now we are in the original slide. And now you know about me and I kind of also know about you. So let's now continue. Uh, still, I would like to tell a bit about uh, Finland because, uh, because you know, it's about you know, networking. So just for your information, probably you, you have heard about it from, uh, from Facebook and social media that uh, Finland is uh, the happiest happiest country in the world. It has become, I think it is the fifth consecutive time. Uh, uh, it is the number one happiest uh, country uh, in the world. And in Finland, often you could see this, this northern lights, uh, the image, this nice image here, 
uh, it's, it's called Aurora Boris or, 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 or in English Northern Lights. It's quite visible uh, often in, during the winter, especially from the north side of, of Finland. And Finland is a country of uh, thousands of lakes. So basically we have here like, you know, almost 200,000 lakes, 187,000 plus lakes are here in Finland. Uh, here, uh, the population is around 5.3 million people. Uh, and Finland probably, you have also probably learned about it uh, on, on Facebook and social media that that Finnish uh, education system is very, very good. And it is very popular uh, due to its high quality education, especially the primary education. So if you want to know more about this, you know, the quality of primary education, you could just go to Google and search Finnish education, uh, primary education, and you will see, you know, plenty of videos by maybe BBC, CNN, uh, and so on. Uh, so, you know, our Finnish education system, primary education system, uh, often comes to this, you know, uh, major major news uh, news news outlets and news channels. And the well-known tech from Finland, yeah, probably you know, uh, it's Nokia Corporation uh, is, is from, from Finland. And, and uh, of course, uh, this, you have probably played this, this game called Angry Birds, uh, which was provided by this company called Rovio Mobile Corporation. Uh, that's all in Finland. And, and then uh, Linux, System. Uh, this this guy uh, also coming from uh, Finland, from U University of Helsinki, if I have not uh, mistaken. So these are kind of you know the Finnish uh, uh, Finnish innovation. Uh, just a few Finnish innovation. Then is still I would like to talk a bit more about. Uh, uh, LUT University, uh, the, where I, I work currently. Uh, so, you know, and on, uh, below you may be fingered. So basically, it's a country between Sweden and 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 giant Russia. Uh, so, uh, due to the you know current political situation, for example, we are we, here. People are a bit afraid uh, because you know the Russia is just just nearby. Uh, so, but anyway, so Finland is located there, and and then uh, Lut University is located here uh, in, in the eastern part of Finland. So basically, we are at the border uh, of, of Russia. So basically, uh, if you if if something happens, uh, this city, the city of Lappeenranta, uh, this city will fall first. So by the way, so LUT University means Lappeenranta uh, Lati University of Technology. Uh, the university uh, was established in 1969. Uh, currently, uh, although the university is fairly, uh, you know, uh, new university, young university, but uh, ranking-wise, we are doing quite good. So it's uh, in, in top 300 in the higher uh, times higher education ranking. Uh, it's a small university, only uh, 6,500 students and, and experts are there. And basically, current uh, we have uh, three campuses. Uh, the first one is in Laparanta, which is the main campus, and and that's uh, that's you know very close to a Russian border. And then uh, Lahti, uh, which is very close to uh, Helsinki, the capital, uh, uh, is, is, is our end, uh, campus. And then Kovula is the third campus, uh, but it's uh, Kovula one is a small one. Uh, the other image you could see uh, that's kind of uh, the university uh, university image. I think the whole Finland uh, looks like this. Uh, so the lake that you could see here, one of the lakes, one of these lakes, 188,000 lakes. Uh, this lake is named as Saima Lake. This is the biggest lake uh, in, in Finland. And uh, so, you know, it's naturally, you know, quite, quite beautiful. So if you are in interest to do um, higher studies, uh, you could consider uh, Finland one potential option. Uh, then a bit about our, our, our software engineering department at, the, at LUT University. So basically, uh, we have a bachelor program 
we have master's program and we have PhD program. We have you know all three types types of program. Uh, most bachelor programs are in Finnish, but nowadays uh, English programs are also organized. Uh, just recently, we have started uh, a joint program uh, with done in China and half education done uh, in Finland. Finland. Uh, so. One, one, one idea, you know, where, where future collaboration could take place. And then uh, several master's program we have. Uh, we have a kind of, you know, four, four master's program. I have just mentioned here two, uh, because these two are, are organized by us. But then other two master's program, they are kind of, you know, joint organization, like uh, we organize it with some other uh, European universities. So that's why I didn't mention, but you can go to the website and you will find uh, you know, other master's program. So the major master's program that I have mentioned here, one is software engineering and digital transformation. Uh, uh, and also, also the second software product management and business. So in our teaching, what we try to do, we teach software engineering stuffs, the technical stuffs, but also we try to teach the business stuffs. So it's a combination between the two. Uh, and, and that's how we think that you will survive in the future job market. And that's why we have designed uh, our program uh, this way. That it's not just about engineering, but it's also about, you know, management and business and, and, and digital transformation and so on. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm heading this uh, software engineering and digital transformation uh, majors, so digital transformation uh, part. Uh, in the, we have three main research areas where you could apply for PhD. Uh, the first one is is software engineering. So here, uh, you know, we we study things like, uh, uh, for example, uh, software quality, software maintenance, uh, then agile development, uh, DevOps, and and other system uh, development uh, methodologies. So these things we teach here and we conduct research about. And then the second uh, second one is digital transformation. And here in digital transformation, we try to look at how digitalization impact uh, businesses, how digitalization impacts society, and what kind of negative and positive impacts it brings, uh, what kind of uh, digital business models could be there, uh, so and how how uh, the digitalization could be sustainable. Uh, how digitalization can help sustainable. So these type of things we, we try to study are in digital transformation and research area. And I'm leading uh, this, this area of digital uh, transformation. And then finally, uh, this human-centered uh, design. So probably you know uh, about it. Human-centered design is about like understanding the users, understand or bringing the users in the software development process, taking uh, taking uh, users' input, feedback, uh, and then try to improve the system. So you know basically this user experience type of works, so and then usability type of uh, you know research uh, fall under this umbrella. So these are kind of you know three main uh, research areas. Uh, what we do at, at LUT Software Engineering Department, and and, and we have have currently uh, seventy uh, experts in our department, uh, and who uh, send email to one of us. Uh, talking about the software engineering experts. So uh, we have created, of course, you can go to our you know, LUT.fi website and then you can find us over there. But what we have also done that we use a label in, in, in Google Scholar profile uh, called LUT software, hashtag LUT software. And then that lists you know, many of our scholars. Of course, you know, not all of them are there. Currently, we are 70 uh, people in the department, but you will find maybe 20 uh, uh, who use this uh, hashtag, uh, LUT software. 
so so here you could see what kind of research interest uh, you have uh, sorry we have like you know this professor Kari Smolander who is uh, the head of the department and his research interest is software engineering information systems enterprise systems and so on Maria Pasivara uh, he is she is interested in agile software development global software development large scale agile development and so on and then you could see me and my research is about digitalization, digital transformation, information systems, blockchain governance. So you, you will find uh, I know uh, us, us in Google Scholar and, and, and then if somehow our doings match with your uh, interest, then feel free to contact us. Then I would also like to uh, mention a bit more about uh, uh, our, our, our blockchain team. So, uh, so here you could see uh, me here, uh, I'm, I'm this professor of, of digital transformation, I'm there. But recently I have uh, recruited two uh, uh, postdocs and interestingly that both of the postdocs are from India. Uh, this Dr. Venkata Marella, uh, he will be joining us uh, from next month and his research area is on chain and cryptocurrencies. And he has earned his PhD from Aalto University in Finland. And then you could see the next guy, uh, Dr. Prabhat Kumar, also from India. And he is doing uh, privacy preserving technologies and blockchain. Currently, he is prob uh, probably a postdoc in IIT Hyderabad. Uh, but I must uh, need to confirm. Uh, but so far, I remember he, he is in IIT Hyderabad. So, but he is supposed to start uh, from May uh, with us in this blockchain team as a postdoc researcher. And then uh, I have this guy, uh, Bahalul Hawk, uh, who is from Bangladesh, and he is doing uh, research on blockchain and explainable AI. So basically he is trying to merge uh, blockchain and AI together to make AI more transparent and, 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 and trustworthy. And then uh, the, uh, the, 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 the girl, Mariam, doing uh, research on, on, on sustainable dimensions of blockchain. She's trying to look at how blockchain uh, can be made sustainable or how blockchain can promote sustainable sustainability. We will cover these type of th topics in this lecture uh, because you know many people say that blockchain is not sustainable but, but, but it could be sustainable uh, but how we will describe we will discuss this thing in our in this in this course. And then uh, the next is to student uh, is, is, is Anastasia Guruji. Uh, she is a Russian student, uh, Russian girl, and she she is doing uh, blockchain enabled digital transformation. So basically she is trying to look at how blockchain uh, enables digital transformation and what kind of positive and negative things it brings, what kind of challenges it brings and how to mitigate the challenges. So this type of things uh, uh, she is uh, trying to do. And then uh, I have this uh, next guy, Hassan Mahmoud, who is also from Bangladesh. And he is doing uh, related things like blockchain governance and, and AI uh, rejection. Uh, again, I will discuss uh, about you know, this blockchain governance thing in our in, in this course. course quite, I'll try to cover so you know what it is uh, uh, later. And then the final PhD student, uh, is Chibuzur Udoku, uh, and he is doing a blockchain service design or blockchain-based application design he is doing, and he is almost ready to defend his, his PhD thesis. Most likely he will defend his PhD thesis in, in August. So that's kind of, you know, you know, you know uh, our blockchain team. So basically, if you have, are interested in blockchain or AI related stuff or somehow you want to merge them together, do contact me. We could start some collaborative uh, research activities and later maybe you could visit us uh, at, at LUT or, or maybe we could do some joint publications and, and so on. So, so we can need to just discuss, uh, you know, what kind of possibilities uh, we, we could bring together. Uh, then let's take a look about the course and its content. Uh, so the first thing is that uh, the focus of this course uh, will be on the research perspectives or you know 
practitioner perspective uh, from a socio-technical point of view. Now this word, this socio-technical point of view, uh, a question to you now, have you ever heard about this term? And if you have heard about it, what it is? And even if, if you, even if you have not heard about it, can you guess what is really the meaning of this? Anyone? Uh, sir, I think uh, that is just about uh, how the technological advancements affect uh, uh, the social behavior and social patterns. That is about it. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, kind of. Exactly. Uh, anybody else want to say anything? Okay. If not, no problem. Let me show you. So yeah, so whoever has told that uh, responded, you are you are right. So we have this, and then we have a technology circle uh, on the right side, and then these two systems somehow uh, interact. They interact with each other. Why? Because think about this: that you develop a software. That software is basically developed by some people. And then it is also uh, used by some people and it has some impact on people's productivity. It can make people's productive, uh, it can make people's life easier or difficult. So basically, you know, it's a, you know, software is a, is a socio-technical system, we can say. So the thing is that we will discuss in this course uh, the phenomena that relates to the socio-technical system. So meaning that we have the blockchain technology, we have the society, uh, or business, or regulation in the society. So where, you know, these two circle interact, our focus of this course is just there. Of course, in order to understand this socio-technical system, you need to learn, know something about the technology, the technical aspects, so that we will try to learn. And also we need to learn about how the society works, meaning that these theories from social science and, and so on. We need to, or, or, or all theories from management science, social science, and, and some regulatory stuff, we need to learn. So we will learn something about about the society, society part, we will learn something about the technology part, and then we will focus on this socio-technical system. I think it's, is it, is it clear, you know, what is the focus of this course? Anyone? I think it's clear, so nobody is responding, yeah. so it's, it's, okay, very good. Yeah, yeah, please feel free to respond. Okay, uh, so uh, because the socio-technical system, that's kind of, you know, the main uh, goal of, of this course. So we will cover uh, technical stops, uh, you know, briefly uh, to form the basic understanding. So if you want to understand the socio-technical system, you need to understand the technology. So if you want to understand this blockchain as a socio-technical system, you need to understand how blockchain works from the technical point of view. So those things we will cover, okay? And I said that I will also cover things related to the society, like, you know, regulatory aspects, business, and, and so on. And as we have already seen that we have here, uh, people from a driver's background. We have seen people, at least one person we have seen uh, from coming from uh, faculty of law, and then uh, quite many people from business, quite many people from computer science, and so on. Uh, so we have a diverse uh, group of people. And I have also seen that you have you know, different level of knowledge on blockchain. So I try to you know, come up with the content in such a way uh, that you could have some knowledge uh, after this course, irrespective of your background or previous knowledge, okay? So it's still about the content of the uh, course. 
Uh, so the content of this course has been adapted from various research articles published in the domain of software engineering and information systems and other related domain. So I have been conducting research on blockchain more than I would say five, six years, around five, six years. So whatever you know I have read so far and whatever I have published so far, some elements of them have been have been covered in this course. And I have given this course to some other uh, European universities in the past. And so far, you know, I have felt I have I have I have got the impression that that you know they, they could learn something very fresh uh, from the course. So I hope that you will also be able uh, to uh, to get get that you know fresh ideas and fair, uh, fresh fresh knowledge. So as I said that I will try to cover the latest research published in software engineering and information systems domain and of course in other related domain. Uh, some of the content are based on my own research work or my co colleagues research work or my students research work. So as I said that I have been conducting research on this topic more than five years. I have published uh, you know, tens of pub papers on it. So you know the findings of those papers uh, all of those research articles I will try to uh, uh, share with you in this course. And of course, you know, some of the contents are based on the white papers. The white papers of Bitcoin, Hyperledger, Ethereum, cases and cases studies. Now, without these white papers, I think, you know, blockchain would have been non-existent. Like if you know about Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin white paper uh, and the Bitcoin technology as such, it was open source and, and the white paper was, was uh, available for everyone to download. So that basically uh, started the whole thing about blockchain. So if you don't take a look on these white papers, at least to some extent, then most likely you are missing you know, the very basic elements. So that's why some of the content uh, you will uh, you can spot the, those are uh, taken from uh, white papers of these uh, of, of these uh, of Bitcoin or Ethereum or Hyperledger and many uh, case studies conducted by IBM and uh, uh, then uh, of course you will see you know tens of uh, online courses today on blockchain. So some of the basic elements uh, you can also spot uh, the, the, from, from uh, these online courses. But, but I try to more like, you know, make it more research focused so that, you know, you have fresh knowledge. But these online courses, they, are, they don't re really give you uh, the latest uh, research uh, knowledge. They give you, you know, kind of uh, the basic knowledge, but not what is going on. Uh, in this uh, whole domain uh, in terms of research that normally is not covered in, in, in many uh, online courses. Okay, so that, that kind of uh, the content of, of, of our, uh, our uh, of this course. And then uh, uh, the first learning outcome is that you will be able to understand the basics of blockchain. So you will be able to understand how blockchain works and its use cases and so on. So when I asked you last time in this, this menti.com, you said that you want to understand the basic stuff. So yeah, uh, we have, I have included those things in my lecture. So after this lecture, you will be able to understand the basics of blockchain and what kind of business cases exist. Uh, you will be you, you will be able to uh, know. Uh, then uh, the next one is very important because this course is about blockchain for business. So it's not just you know a technical course. It's about blockchain for business. So you need to be able to solve 
business problems or practical problems using blockchain. So after my lecture, after the, this course, possibly it will create some kind of thinking inside you to attempt or how to attempt to solve a problem using blockchain, a, a business problem or a societal problem that you face, uh, you know, uh, face uh, uh, all the time from your experience, you can try to solve or you can imagine how, how to solve such problem with blockchain, okay? And then the third one is uh, get an overall picture of the, of the research advances on blockchain, mainly from the socio-technical perspectives. So you already know what is socio-technical perspective, but what I mean here, like, I want to give you an overall research, uh, picture of research. As said that I have covered, you know, the latest research articles. I, I will present you latest research articles. So that's why it is, you know, naturally that you will get a picture of, of the latest research advances on blockchain from socio-technical perspectives. And then, uh, okay, this is the same thing. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, then finally, uh, you will be able to participate in research discussions or discussions regarding blockchain with your peers, with your colleagues, and so on. So you will have the basic understanding so that you can take part in some discussions. So that's kind of you know our, our learning uh, outcomes from this course. Uh, then I would uh, you know request you uh, that uh, I would like to have uh, this whole course uh, very much interactive. Okay, the session needs to be very much interactive. Uh, I want to create a collaborative learning environment with you, which basically means that you need to take part in discussion. I will ask you, uh, you know, questions or, you know, I will ask you comments on, on some topics. As I have seen that some of you already know something about blockchain. So you, some of you are to some extent expert. So, you know, what I think that the perspective that I have Okay, it, it may be okay perspective, it might be a good perspective, but of course you can also bring new perspective. It is not that my perspective is always the best perspective. So you are free to bring your own perspective and I want to hear those. So I can, you know, I will ask you, you know, some questions, some comments about some things, some topics, and then, you know, try to uh, take part. You know, of course, you know, uh, the ones uh, who are expert, probably easy for them to take part, but don't hesitate. If you are not an expert, if, you're, if you have limited or almost no knowledge, you are free to talk. I mean, if you don't talk, then I would not be able to understand, uh, you know, what is really needed. So with this talking and with this, you know, conversation, I think we can learn better. So what I really mean that we want to, I want to build a collaborative learning environment with you, okay? And then also what I will do is that I will put you uh, in some group discussions. Basically, there will be some exercises that you need to do in groups uh, to by the end of today, uh, I will give you uh, one exercise uh, and then you need to basically, uh, work in a group, and I hope that uh, Dr. Divya will help me to create the group. Uh, so basically, uh, out of, uh, if you are, let's say, 30, 40 people, uh, maybe, you know, for each group, uh, five people will be there, and I will give you an, uh, a, an exercise. You need to think overnight, and then tomorrow, when we will start the session again, then you could, uh, you know, present your your, your findings based on your group discussion. 
So as I said, that you will present uh, the findings for your uh, your group discussion to us uh, tomorrow. So each day we will have this. Tomorrow morning you could start uh, uh, this group discussion and and and, and you know uh, solve it and then. Uh, before we start the lecture, uh, we'll, I would like to hear uh, what did you discuss and what kind of findings did you have. So that kind of thing we will do. Uh, so uh, this is uh, you know, our uh, uh, interaction technique. So now today's agenda. So today's agenda is, is about introducing the basic vocabulary of blockchain. I know that yesterday uh, Dr. Devia has already introduced some basic vocabularies, but I will give a different perspective of these uh, these vocabularies, uh, so that your learning becomes even 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 more permanent. Quick break. Maybe uh, ten minutes, minutes of to take, and 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 just to mention that I have quite a lot of content for every day. I have around let's say total two hundred of slides, two hundred slides for this course. So I will give you just too much information, a lot of information, a lot of uh, you know things to learn. So I think that it is very important that we take some break. Let's say. Uh, one one quick break uh, each each uh, one, after each one hour, so that you know you have you don't have you know much uh, cognitive load. So just uh, let's take a break of uh, ten minutes, grab a, a cup of coffee or whatever you want to do, and then uh, then uh, we start uh, just after ten uh, ten minutes. So now uh, I don't know what is the time in India, but here it is uh, fourteen thirty three. Uh, maybe in, in India it is it is uh, 17 yeah it is 17 30, uh, 17 or something like that so seven, we will start 1715 okay so let's take a break break
Okay, so it's now the time. Uh, a question to Dr. Divya, uh, if you are here. Uh, Dr. Divya, can you hear me? Uh, can anybody hear me? Okay, well, maybe Dibia, Dr. Dibia is not here. Uh, Dr. Dibia, are you there? Okay, no problem. I just want to ask, so according to today's schedule, uh, the late, I was wondering if four hour is possible or not. So today I do not really have anything to do uh, in the evening, so I could do four hours. Instead of three hours, can we do four hours? Yes, sir, we can. Yes, sir, yes. Hello. 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 Yes, sir, I was in a different meeting, actually. Okay, okay, so a question to you. Uh, I don't know if you have heard, heard it or not. Uh, the question is, uh, so today we had this three-hour session. So I was thinking that can we have four hours already today? And maybe uh, the later lecture, then probably we can cut one hour. Yes, sir, I we can. If, if participants have no problem, we can. Okay. Yeah, the uh, participants are, have been saying no problem, but is there anyone who has problem? Okay, so no, no one has problem. So, okay, so maybe we try to then do, do four hours today. Okay, so. As I said, uh, today's agenda is uh, introducing the basic vocabularies uh, on blockchain. And, uh, and oh, by the way, so can you hear me uh, loud and clear? Yes, yes sir. Okay, yeah. So, so yesterday, I think Dr. Divya uh, gave a very uh, nice introduction uh, to the basic vocabulary but I will try to uh, cover uh, kind of similar uh, concepts and vocabularies, but maybe in a different way uh, so that your learning becomes more uh, permanent. So, basic vocabularies of, of blockchain. Uh, as said, I want to have this session uh, very much uh, interactive. So, a question to you. Uh, in, on the screen, you could see the term called distributed ledger technology or DLT. So, a question to you. Have you heard about it? And if you have heard about it, uh, what is it? Even if you have not heard about it, can you guess? What it is? Anyone? Uh, sir, it's something like peer-to-peer -peer transaction. Peer-to-peer -peer transactions, uh, not real transaction, but uh, yeah, it's 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 a ledger. It's a ledger. Yeah, transaction ledger. Yes, sir. Yes, say. sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Peer-to-peer -peer transaction ledger. Okay, good. Yeah. Anyone? Any? Anything? Anything else? Anyone can comment? Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Uh, I don't know much about it, but what uh, Doctor Dibya told yesterday, it means mm -hmm. that for a transaction, uh, mm -hmm. usually ledger is kept at by one central agency. Wherein in this system. This gets distributed amongst all participants. So yeah. this is a technology wherein ledger is distributed 
among all the participants who are there uh, a part of this technology a uh, part of this chain that's yeah, all part of this network yeah 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 absolutely absolutely so you have learned quite well from yesterday very good this is very good yeah i got the answers uh, uh, that, that that i was looking for so basically both of you are, are, are correct uh, uh, what you have said okay so the next question is is can anyone tell me uh, what is its benefit? So we know that distributed ledger is uh, is, is a peer a peer to peer ledger. It is uh, the network. But what is its benefit? Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, sir, sir, the first benefit is we have the transparency and uh, there is a mismatch to find the any mishappening during the ledgers because lots of yeah. trans uh, transparency and peer to peer transactions. Yeah, yeah. And so cyber this, attacks and financial frauds are also reduced by using the distributed ledgers. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, very good. And and let's say that if some one participant in the network somehow behaves in a wrong way, in a bad way, uh, and he or she wants to uh, change the content of the ledger, but still he or she cannot because you know it's 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 in the it's a distributed one and and others have 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 different copies so ultimately he or she will not be able to change it and of course you know reducing a you know, cyber attack and and so on so yeah very good points you have mentioned anybody else and if uh, anyone anyone else want to do add something so uh, i want so i'm dr navni and i yeah. want to add in the simple words, a laser yes. is uh, something which uh, have uh, various information. Point number yes. one is yeah. uh, various yeah. information is there and that information keeps on added whenever some authorized person, they write something or they want to uh, give some input to the laser. So yeah. number one is yeah. uh, the information and distributed means every, that information is distributed among the persons those who are using the admins they can view uh, the information and only authorized yeah. persons are there they can uh, they can uh, uh, make some addition but because this is a laser maze uh, no one can change any information information yeah. cannot yeah. be changed so yeah. this is the term of what i understand from this yes but you are very good you are understood correct and you have also understood uh, you know it's, it's benefit uh, that's also uh, correct. Okay. And then, uh, so distributed ledger technology. Uh, but how can we build one? How can we have uh, a, a DLT, a distributed ledger technology? And the answer is that block way to build distributed ledger, distributed ledger. Okay, so there are different ways you could build a distributed ledger, but blockchain is one of them. And we will talk about blockchain in this course. But let's take a look a bit more about why this ledger technology came, came into, uh, into our attention. What is, what is really the reason behind? Let's take a look. Uh, so, uh, it is kind of fair to say, uh, if you think about, about the history of computing, uh, the history of computing technologies and architecture, if you think about it, it is quite fair to say that, well, we are moving toward decentralization. In the past, we had very much centralized system. But nowadays, we are kind of moving toward decentralization. Now, I want to ask you now, uh, if we are moving toward decentralization, or, you know, previously we had this centralized system, what is really the main problem with centralized system? Can you tell me at least one problem of centralized system? Anyone? 
what is the problem of centralized system? I think uh, sir, I am not sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, I am not sure, but maybe the uh, sir, maybe the cyber attacks will be in uh, more in centralization system. Yeah, there is a yeah. chance. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, it's about sir, like you know. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Someone. Sir, someone wants to say sir, something. Sir, when any any part of the system goes down, then the complete system goes down in the centralized form of. Yeah. In, in, in the, in... Yeah. Yeah. So that's the that's the thing. That's the thing. Yes. So single point of failure, right? So in the centralized system, there is a possibility that if if the system goes down, everything is down. Yeah, so the single point of failure is there. That's one of the major problem. And so, you know, the cyber act thing you mentioned, yeah, that's also a partial reason. But also, you could think in this way that uh, let's say that you own a system, uh, you own uh, uh, a centralized system, and basically you decide, you know, uh, to whom you want to give access or, or not. So basically, you know, you only one owner, like the owner of the OSINT system dictates the whole thing. If he decides to give you access, you know, you have access. If you do, if that owner doesn't kind of, you know, decide to give you access, then, then you don't have. So the owner has all the power to decide. So that's kind of you know another uh, problem of of the centralized system. Now uh, I will show you one image and try to think what it is in your view. What is it? Can anybody tell me what is what is this image? What can you see here? Large computers. Large computer, yeah, yeah, you were you were quite close. Yes, very good. Anybody else want to say anything? Yes, centralized in compared to, uh, in compared to uh, the client server, original client server architecture. But there is still some problem here. Now, if you think about it, that that who maintains this this cloud system, the cloud, who owns this cloud? Definitely a corporation, maybe the IBM, maybe Facebook, Dropbox, and whatnot. There are so many corporations and they, they own this cloud. They have their own cloud. So basically, this basically means that if you, if me as Nazmul, I want to keep my data to, let's say, Google's cloud in Google Drive, I need to I need to kind of trust Google that Google will protect my privacy. I need to trust that Google has uh, secured, you know, security uh, encryption techniques and whatever, you know, this, they, they will make sure that, uh, that, that my data uh, is not uh, uh, used by someone else without my consent, and so on. So basically, I need to trust Google. And same goes for a business, for a company. Like we are now talking over Teams, right? This is a Microsoft product. So we need to kind of trust Teams that our data, our personal data, will be secured there. Uh, but historically, this is not really the case. We know many instances, like you know this Facebook Cambridge Analytica case. You probably know about it. That that uh, that this Cambridge uh, Analytica, this company, uh, got uh, quite a lot of data. Uh, that that they should not get, and that data has been used for for the U.S. election. 
and for this reason, uh, Mark Zuckerberg has been testified uh, by the Senate. And then, uh, of course, uh, the Google CEO has been also, you know, testified many times. And there have been, uh, you know, really, in many cases, probably you have heard that there is really a lack of trust. People don't really trust these big corporations because you do not really know how your data is being used. So this owner has kind of the data, the, the platform owner or the cloud owner basically has all the power and they can basically do whatever they want to do. So they are powerful and the consumer and the small have to use you know, the, 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 this big corporation's tool and make uh, and hope that they will behave in a trustworthy manner. manner. I mean, uh, the, the cloud will be safe. So that is the problem, okay? So there is a middleman. The concept is here, there is a middleman to whom we need to trust to make sure that our data, uh, our data uh, is secured. We need to trust that our data will be secured. Now I will show you another image. Anyone? This is looks like Metro City connected with banks and uh, buildings and uh, well connected society. Yeah, well connected society. Yeah, uh, kind of. Uh, yeah, well connected. Uh, sorry. Uh, the network system. Yeah, some kind of network. Yeah. Point to point connection. Point to point connection. Yeah, you are absolutely right. So this is basically the whole idea of this uh, DLT or distributed ledger technology. So you could see here. Uh, you could see here uh, that uh, you know this bank is the bank is connected uh, with some uh, organizations, with some individual, with the ledger. You could see some kind of book over there. So each one of has a book. So the bank has a book, and the organizations have a book, and 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 and. individuals and group of individuals also have the book. So it's the, this is an example of a you know, distributed ledger that now you do not really need to trust the middleman, uh, but more like, you know, point to point connection. Uh, so the whole idea of distributed ledger technology is to provide more control to the end users and, and somehow uh, reducing uh, the middlemen and also improving uh, the processes. Okay, so this is uh, an example of uh, distributed ledger technology. So now let's try to really define what is distributed ledger technology. So the distributed ledger technology you probably you have already described and i completely agree with that but i i just you know wrote uh, uh, the the definition uh, so that dlt is a type of data structure that resides in multiple computing devices across the globe so it's a data structure it's data and that resides in multiple nodes multiple computing devices and across the globe or you know kind of uh, maybe inside a country or, 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 or something like that. But the point is that the data is distributed. Uh, then blockchain, then what is blockchain? Blockchain is one way to build a distributed ledger technology. There are actually other ways of distributed ledger technology. Now, if someone asks you that and tells you that DLT and blockchain are same thing. To some extent, yes, 
but again, no, because blockchain is one way to build the distributed ledger technology. There are other ways of distributed ledger technology, uh, other ways to build distributed ledger technology. So remember this. So blockchain is one way. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, that there are other ways to build distributed ledger technology. For example, there is one called hash graph. So hash graph is also uh, helps also to build distributed ledger technology, but this is uh, kind of you know uh, beyond the scope of, of, of our lecture uh, about this hash graph. But just you know uh, just for your information, that there are several uh, approaches through which you could build uh, a distributed ledger. Blockchain is one. Another very important thing that you need to keep in mind because people uh, somehow uh, think that blockchain is equivalent to Bitcoin. You need to understand that blockchain is not Bitcoin, but Bitcoin is an application that uses blockchain to record transaction. Uh, the Bitcoin and blockchain, you know, many people use them as synonym because Bitcoin was pro the first, very first application that was developed on blockchain. And also people could use distributed ledger and blockchain as synonym because blockchain is the one that got, you know, probably the highest popularity uh, through which distributed ledger can be built. So somehow they have become kind of synonym, but but you know, try to remember that they are not really synonym, but make the concept clear that blockchain is one way to build a DLT, a distributed ledger, and Bitcoin is one application, one blockchain. Okay? Uh, just for your information, the concept of a distributed ledger uh, existed uh, prior, to, uh, prior to Bitcoin. Uh, but Bitcoin is the very first application that uh, one uses. Yesterday, you have learned about this, that uses cryptography, peer-to-peer -peer network, and a consensus algorithm to verify the transactions. Now, come, now talking about, about the cryptograph, I think uh, yesterday, Dr. Divya, uh, you know, showed how this cryptography works. Uh, he, he explained the CIA, confidentiality, integrity, authentication, availability thing quite nicely. So Bitcoin is the first application that uses cryptography. Just to re refresh your mind, with this cryptography, we can make sure that let's say that me, Nazmul, has sent a message uh, to Divya. Uh, uh, so Divya can kind of, you know, uh, kind of, you know, make sure that it is indeed me who has sent him the message. So I will encrypt it through my uh, keys, through my uh, private key and send it to him and he can decrypt it with his uh, key, uh, with, sorry, with, with my public key and to make sure that this is indeed Nazmul who sent me the message. Divya can make sure that it is indeed Nazmul who sent him the message. So Bitcoin uses uh, this cryptography and we will learn more about this uh, uh, in, in this lecture. Uh, but for now, uh, you know, just to uh, remember that Bitcoin is the first application on blockchain that uses cryptography. And then next one is peer-to-peer -peer network. So you have seen uh, this point-to-point -point network. So that kind of peer-to-peer, -peer, like without the middleman, without, without Google. I, without Google, my computer can interact with your computer without any middleman. So with, in the peer-to-peer -peer network, so Bitcoin is the first application that uses uh, cryptography and peer-to-peer -peer network. And then finally, a consensus algorithm to verify the transactions. Now, as I said that Bitcoin has a peer-to-peer -peer network, then how would we make sure that when some transaction is coming, 
if it is valid or not. If we have, let's say, the middleman, for example, the bank. So the bank can verify. So if I transfer some money to Divya uh, through bank, so bank is the middleman, so bank can verify it. But here, what we are doing, I am directly sending the money to Divya. Uh, so the question is, how do this network, how does this peer-to-peer -peer network uh, make sure that the transaction that I have done, that I have paid Divya 10 euros, how to, how to really verify that? And for that, this consensus algorithm is used. So consensus is kind of a mechanism through which uh, the nodes or, or the computing devices in the network decide whether to add a transaction or, uh, to, the, to the blockchain or not, whether the transaction is valid or not. So this is an algorithm to verify the authenticity of the transaction and to add it in the block. And we will learn more about this, how this whole consensus algorithm work in this lecture. But for now, just uh, remember that, that you know, Bitcoin uses cryptography, peer-to-peer -peer network, and consensus algorithm. And not only Bitcoin, but most of the blockchain, or all blockchain, use uh, cryptography, peer-to-peer -peer network, and consensus algorithm. Okay? Is everything clear so far? Sir, I have a question. Yeah, yeah please go ahead. Uh, sir, you said that blockchain is one way to build DLT. So yeah. in what aspect uh, DLT kind of uh, supersets the blockchain? Means uh, the key aspects or differences in which DLT is like superset for blockchain. DLT is superset for a blockchain, exactly. Uh, so this is uh, one, one, one way, one way to build uh, uh, a distributed ledger. DLT means just distributed ledger. And now you could build distributed ledger in different ways and blockchain is one way. So blockchain is under the family of distributed ledger. So this way you need to think. And then, uh, you know, in different implementation, for example, Hashgraph, uh, maybe they have different consensus type algorithm uh, or, or different mechanisms. Uh, they probably use different different cryptography technique. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we, we, this is something uh, that needs to be also checked. But if I remember correctly, uh, there there are you know difference like with hashgraph and, and blockchain. Uh, hashgraph uh, didn't get that much popularity, uh, but but blockchain, as you know, that that hugely popular. Yeah, but but there are there have you know some some differences uh, how how they build a distributed ledger. Okay. Okay, sir. Yeah. So uh, then uh, the the question and question to you. You have done. Uh, you have learned quite well yesterday. Uh, so we know now about blockchain and and yesterday. No, sorry. We know now about uh, DLT. And we also know about uh, blockchain because you have uh, learned about it yesterday. So the question is, uh, can you define blockchain in your own world? Anyone? Anyone? Are you, are you all there? Uh, hello, sir. sir. Uh, hello, sir. Yeah, 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 please. Yes, uh, please. Sir, blockchains is basically a technique which stores the data in uh, um, algorithms just like uh, using the digital uh, zero or one in the form of it's something like that. Yeah, something like that. Yes. Sir, yeah, anybody sir? else? Yes, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, so blockchain is basically a set of blocks chained in a format such that blocks contains the transactions uh, mm -hmm. which are validated and verified by the miners and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and these are like uh, if we draw analogy it 
it will look like chapters of a book so which mm -hmm. which are updated on a periodical basis so mm -hmm. that uh, uh, the transactions are immutable yeah yeah i think uh, you have given a very comprehensive answer and i think uh, uh, you know I, I got what i was looking for but let me now share uh, uh, with you what i have written here yeah so first blockchain is a distributed ledger to record transactions or data and now here you need to remember uh, it's not just about transactions it's about any data so bitcoin uh, stores transactions because bitcoin is a cryptocurrency so that's why it, it is about transaction but when you would talk about blockchain in a broader sense then basically you know uh, it could store any type of data okay uh, so blockchain creates a chronological chain of blocks so this is exactly what you mentioned uh, one minute ago that blockchain creates it's, it's a collection of blocks so it's a chronological chain of blocks and therefore the name is block and chain so block blocks are chained together and that's why its name is blockchain uh, then each block contains a list of transactions again you could think about not only transactions but any type of data bundled together so in one block, you could have many transactions or many data. They are bundled together. So this is what you all already mentioned one minute ago. And as I mentioned that other data such as medical records, property agreements, or any type of data can be included in the block. So it's not just about transactions. If you develop a blockchain system, to store medical records, it's perfectly possible. Or storing property agreements, it's perfectly possible. Okay. Uh, then, in any block, uh, in any blockchain, the very first block, the very first block, is called the genesis block. The block zero or block one, the very first block, is the genesis block okay and each block is time stamped so each block has uh, has, has a time uh, has a uh, and then each block refers to the previous block as i mentioned earlier and you also mentioned to mentioned that there is a chain so it has to refer to the previous block so each block has to refer to the previous block to make a chain so two points here, like each block is time stamped and it, uh, each block refers to the previous block. Okay. And with, it uses cryptographic hash. You have learned about hashes uh, yesterday, cryptographic hashes. And today I will also uh, you know, go through those. So with cryptographic hashes and time stamp, blockchain basically creates immutable data and how it is creating immutable data i will show you uh, later okay so this is uh, about blockchain but that was kind of you know uh, very much uh, first very basic about blockchain uh, the first bit generation blockchain but then uh, blockchain later has been improved like first generation blockchain is called the bitcoin uh, but then blockchain has improved and uh, recently uh, or, or in, from the second generation, not recently, but since second generation, uh, there is an option called smart contracts. And, and with the help of smart contracts, uh, basically blockchain is defined in, in a di bit different way. Here uh, there is another definition. So blockchain is a peer-to-peer -peer distributed ledger. Yeah, we already know about it and then forced by a consensus algorithm. Yeah, we also know about it, that in order to add a, a, a block or add a transaction to the blockchain, you need to have this consensus algorithm. So 
Yeah, we have learned about it. But then it says that combined with a system for smart contracts, But then the question is, what is a smart contract? Have you ever heard about a smart contract? Anyone? Have you heard about it? And if yes, what is it? Sir, they are simply the programs uh, that, that, that run on the predetermined conditions. And when these conditions are met, the, the contract executes. And the overall objective is that that so typically they are used to automate the execution of an agreement when the conditions are met. Yes, exactly. Very good. This is exactly the thing. So I, I can give you an example. Uh, let's, you know, first, as, as, as you mentioned, that, that, that it is, you know, piece of code, a piece of code, and we agree with some kind, some, uh, some, some conditions. So a contract, so a smart contract is a contract written in code. So basically whenever the condition is fulfilled, it is automatically executed without, without human intervention. Now I will give you an example. Let's assume that me, Nazmul, uh, will make a contract with a, with a, uh, with a electricity company uh, called, uh, let's say, La Paranta Energia. Uh, La Paranta Energy, uh, this, this is the company name, for example. So me, Nazmul has, has made a contract with, with this company that if, uh, if the electricity price per kilowatt goes down to four cents, then I will make a contract with you. I will buy your electricity and I will pay you 100 euros. So I make a contract with the electricity company saying that if the price or whenever the price goes down to 4 cents per kilowatt hour, I will immediately have a contract with you. And in return to this contract, I will pay you advance in advance 100 euros. So this is something we could write in normal contract, uh, paper-based contract and sign it there. But what is the problem there? The problem is that somebody needs to, uh, you know, manually check oh, every day, okay, the price is now 4.2 cents. No, still this contract will not be executed. But then when the price will uh, go below 4, 4, 4 cents, then it will be, uh, then someone needs to execute it. But here in the smart contract, what is happening is that it is automatically, it will happen without the human intervention. So whenever the price goes down, uh, goes below four cents, my contract will be automatically executed. Money from my account automatically go to this company's account, energy company's account, and so on. So the whole process will be automatic, automatized, as you mentioned, without the human intervention, you you, 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 you you automatize the process. And the good thing is that these smart contracts could be stored in the blockchain and also its output, what happened really, the output of the, pro, of the contract, that could also be stored in the blockchain. So Hank, I, I somehow felt that maybe this energy company, uh, you know, did not really execute it properly or or maybe you know charging me more money or something like that then what we could do just we could just go to the blockchain entry and see based on that we see the time stamp we see the price we basically see everything there when how where uh, how you know this this smart contract was executed everything will be there so there shouldn't be like a middleman. So if there is some kind of, you know, case happens, like uh, you, you think that the comp company is trying to, uh, you know, charge you more money and you want to file a case or something like that. Uh, so you don't really need a, a middleman here. You just need to go to the blockchain and you could see that 
what happened. So you don't need a lawyer if it goes to the, uh, to, you know, court or whatever, you know, you, you don't need a lawyer anymore. So I think, you know, the concept of a smart contract is, is, is quite clear now. Uh, so together are uh, these, uh, you know, this peer-to-peer -peer distributed ledger consensus and smart contracts uh, and so on. Together these, uh, we can build new generation of applications that establishes trust, accountability, and transparency at their core while streamlining processes and legal constraints. Now, the example I have given you exactly says this. So if you have everything written in, in the blockchain, the smart contract execution, if you, if you, if you kind of, you know, uh, uh, you know, include it uh, in the blockchain, then you can go, you know, accountability is there, the process is transparent, yeah? So whenever you need, you can verify it and go and check. And at the same time, we are basically streamlining the business process. So think about this. Like if we had a normal contract, then somebody, say a human need, need to kind of, you know, check all the time when the price goes down below, uh, you know, four cents. And then once it is it is, it is there, uh, then then uh, the contract starts to execute, and then I need to go and and then you know send let's say 100 euros from my bank account to the bank account of 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 this energy company, and and then after that after that if there is some problem, I need to uh, I need to discuss with the with with, with the lawyers and so on. So whole, this whole process, we are basically streamlining the whole business process. And also these legal constraints, we are, we, are, we are streamlining, right? So as you could see, that blockchain helps us to streamline our business processes. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay. If no question, I continue. It's still a bit more about uh, what is blockchain. Uh, so the question is here, like, you know, I'll probably make the transactions, but then who are really adding them uh, to the block? So basically, uh, this thing has been dedicated to the minor nodes. So basically, the minor nodes bundle the valid transactions into a block. Okay, so the minor nodes or minor computer, uh, they bundle all the valid transactions into a block, and then the miner need, miners need to solve a cryptographic puzzle. And I will explain this cryptographic puzzle in a later lecture, but for now. Uh, uh, you know, uh, just remember that these miners uh, need to solve a puzzle to find the new block. And once the new block is found, he informs the other miners in the network that yeah, I got the I got the uh, Uh, you know, I got, I solved the puzzle and I got the block and I will add, add the block to the blockchain. This whole process is known as, as proof of work and it often requires significant, of, of course, why? because you need to solve the money and also the so and one basically wins so it needs really so each one power for all the miners even if the miner fails to find out what this is the consensus algorithm uh, that 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 beat
Bitcoin users. And I will explain uh, this. But for now, work takes significant computing power. Because I'm trying to solve a very, very difficult cryptographic puzzle. Okay. So then the question is, what are the content of each block? What does a block contain? So each block contains the following information. Uh, the reference to the previous block. Okay. Uh, yeah, so we already know it because we, it's, a, it's a block chain. It's a chain, uh, chain of blocks. So of, obviously you need to have each block block needs to contain the reference to the previous block. Then the proof of work signature or, uh, and, and nonce, and we will explain uh, what is nonce in, in the coming, coming, coming slides. Uh, then a timestamp, you know, when, when, uh, a time, basically a time uh, about, about, about the, when the block is created or, or something like that. And then finally, the most important thing is the transactions included in that particular block. Okay, so these are four are kind of the basic things uh, that that each block would contain. Now, this is an example. This is an example which basically shows how the blockchain will look like. Here you see we have four blocks. Okay, block 51, block 52, block 53, and block 54. Uh, block 51 is the oldest block out of these four blocks, and block 54 is the newest block out of these four. And what you can see, let's take a look at block 54. You could see that there are two things at the beginning. Proof of work signature, starting with some weird number like you know uh, three zeros and blah and, and some numbers and, and, and characters, and then so so that's the that's the proof of work signature. But then you have this previous block. That's also beginning with with these four zero uh, five zeros and then some some numbers and and, and characters. And if you take a look, this previous block, the block 54's previous block uh, is, the number is same as block 53's uh, proof of work. Take a look at block 53's uh, proof of work. It starts with uh, five zeros and then 90B41BX and block 54's previous block has the same uh, same number, same value over there. So five zeros, nine zero, B4, one BX. And similarly, block 53's previous block is the same number or same value as block 54's proof of work. And similarly. So this is how the chain is created. So each block is basically referring to the previous block. Okay. And then I told that each block will also contain some transactions. And here you see each block has three transactions. Of course, the number of transactions could vary. Maybe in one block, there could be only two transactions. In another block, there could be 10 transactions. But here in this example, they just kept the same number. But not necessarily, this is always the case. So you see that we have these three transactions there. But what is here interesting, like in a block 54, you have three transactions. But what is interesting here, that the transactions are also some weird digits or weird characters. So they are not like, you know, me, Nazmul, sending uh, $10 to, to Divya. So this is 
The reason is simple. Yesterday you have learned about this cryptography, the uh, signing it with with your private key, and then creating a message uh, or, or or cryptographic signature. So that's the cryptographic signature here. So probably in this first transaction, maybe it is there like I Nazmul send ten dollar to Divya, but then I have signed it with my private key. And then I have created this hash. And that hash value is stored as the transaction. And so on, and so on, so other transactions. Okay. So this is uh, the example of, of, of one example, uh, one blockchain. But why, this is here, one, one thing is very important is that uh, think about the security point of view that which block is more secure. Definitely the older blocks. Uh, because if you want to change something, let's say in block 51, then block 52, block 53, block 54, they all will be invalid because these blocks are referring to each other. So block 52 is referring to block 51, block 53 is referring to block 52. So basically, if you change some data in block 51, then uh, the whole chain, this, all these blocks will become invalid. And you need to, or the miners need to recompute the whole thing. And as you see that recomputing something, recomputing blockchain blocks takes significant amount of processing power. So you need to basically uh, gain quite a bit of more than 50% of, of, of processing power to be able to change some blocks, especially if the blocks are older blocks. Then you need to recompute the whole thing, many blocks thereafter. But think about this. Uh, if you want to change the block 54 only, some data in block 54, Let's say I send I want I send ten dollars to to Divya instead of I wrote uh, I try to change it to nine dollars. In that case, only block fifty four will be invalid, but other blocks block fifty one, block fifty two, block fifty three, they will be intact. So, so if the attack if you know the attacker you know do these changes, they just need to you know, compute only one block. So only block 54, he has to compute. So from this thing, you could understand that it is very difficult for the attacker to change the older blocks, but maybe a bit easier uh, to, uh, to, to, to change something to the newest added block. Okay, so that's why I have written here that block 54 is less secure, but then when you are moving left, uh, block 51 is more secure. Okay, so this is an example of blockchain. Uh, but then uh, there is uh, uh, even more things. Uh, so what I had not really mentioned before. So here you could see uh, there are three blocks. So here I would explain the concept of Merkle tree. Uh, so here you see there are three blocks. Block one has some header, block two, it has some header, and then block three, it has some header. As mentioned, that each block will have, uh, will, will refer to the previous block. So that's why let's take a look at block two header. We see that it has the previous header hash. Okay, so basically here block one's uh, hash will be here. But then one additional thing you could see is this Merkle root. And what it is really? And you could see here that it looks like a binary tree. So the Merkle root is basically a hash of hashes. Now, now you need to go down in this, in this uh, picture. In block two, you see there are four transactions. 
transactions. Transaction one, so transaction A, transaction B, transaction C, and transaction D. So let's assume that in block uh, this two, block, block two, we have four transactions. Okay. So you know that each transaction uh, from previous yesterday's lecture you also have learned, and today I have also mentioned that each transactions hash is computed, right? So we compute the hash of transaction A, transaction B, and then uh, we get this hash of A, hash of B, and then uh, is, there is a typo here. Uh, it, this transaction C should be hash of C, C, and then transaction D should be hash D, hash of D. Uh, all all are B in the in the in the second layer. That's a mistake. So the other two will be C and D. Okay. So basically, the idea here is that we are uh, we are taking the hash of of each transaction. Okay. So transaction A and transaction B are hashed. And then they are again hashed together to create a new hash of hash of A and, ha and hash of B. So a new hash is created. Okay. And similarly, on the right side, this hash of C and hash of D is created, uh, is, is merged and, and created a new hash. Okay. And then out of these new hashes, Again, you hash those and then create the Merkle, Merkle root. So the whole idea here is that if you include the Merkle root of this transaction, it basically contains all the hashes of the transactions. So it is just enough if you verify, if you want to verify, if you just uh, verify the Merkle root, you know, the top hash, if you just verify that, then you can verify the whole thing. You just don't need to go and, 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 and verify transaction A, transaction B. So if you want to verify, if you just verify a miracle root, that will be enough. So it, it, it basically, this miracle tree basically helps to improve the verification process. So this miracle root, this hash number, this has value, contains all the hashes a combination of uh, combination of all the hashes of that block of that blocks transactions okay so this is uh, the uh, Merkle uh, concept of Merkle root now we we have seen here uh, that you know this uh, these blocks have uh, headers uh, now let's take a look. Uh, what are really the headers, uh, as in, in data fields, and their sizes? So these are these are the data fields. Uh, data fields of 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 Bitcoin header. Bitcoin is an as an example. So for your information, uh, Bitcoin headers length is 80 bytes. Okay. Uh, you could, uh, you know, add uh, these bytes here, and you will find 80. So version is eight, four bytes. Previous hash is 32 bytes. Miracle root. I just sp have spoken about it. Uh, 32 bytes. Time. This is the time stamp. Uh, it's four bytes. Bits four bytes, and then nonce four bytes. Now I, you could see uh, the explanation of each of these uh, these data fields. So, but, but together, the whole header has a size of 80 bytes. Now, take a look of these, all these things. The, the first one is version. It is four bytes, and it, is about, it, it contains the version number. So, blockchain uh, software had, had different versions, and, uh, and many, it, it, it got many updates uh, over the years. So it, it, is, it contains the version number. Uh, so, so the block contains uh, the version number. Then, as I mentioned many times, that the block also contains previous hash. And what is this previous hash? Uh, it's a character of 32 bytes. Okay. So it's the hash of previous block header. 
okay and then merkel root again it's a 32 uh, 32 uh, bytes uh, you know uh, data field and merkel root means uh, the hash of all transactions in that particular uh, uh, block so merkel root of the transactions included in the block yeah we have already learned about it and then time time is is four bytes and it is uh, you know time stamp uh, is the time stamp of the block epoch time stamp of the block and then uh, uh, beats this is interesting this is four bytes but it basically uh, you know represents the difficulty of the network so as I mentioned earlier, that the miners had to solve a cryptographic puzzle. And the cryptographic puzzle is quite difficult to solve. And BEATS is one attribute, one thing that that kind of, you know, uh, defines uh, the, the difficulty level. Okay, but we will see, you know, exact, exact uh, thing related to BEATS uh, in, 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 le in later slides. And then the final number, uh, final thing is called nonce. It is also four bytes. And this is something uh, that is included, that is taken into account with the data or with the transaction bundle to create hash. Now, this is also, this might sound quite quite difficult to understand but but once I I will show you a graphical example then it will be easier but for now try to remember that nonce is a number it could be for it is a four bytes number it could be anything between uh, between 2 to the power 32 so it's a four bytes number and with that number plus uh, plus with with you know the the, the transactions, uh, the miners try to create a hash out of it. Okay, but these things will be much more clearer in later slides, and then I will ask you questions if if it, it was clear. But this is an example here. You could see uh, this is an example of of Bitcoin header. Uh, my problem is that I cannot really, you know, tell you the color. I am, you know, I cannot explain colors well, but you could match the color, like you know, the version uh, in in the upper upper uh, image, uh, the version uh, that color, uh, and and the later image has this zero 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 two zero. They are of same color. So this basically means that this is the version. So. And then a previous hash is 32, uh, 32 bytes. And then for starting from 5, 8, 7, 3, 5, 7, this is uh, the previous hash and so on. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, in, in hexadecimal format. So it's not very much understandable. Uh, that's why it's not understandable. It's a hexadecimal format. But this is uh, just to show that this is a typical uh, Bitcoin header. Uh, header looks like. So it has the version and then it has a previous hash, it has then a medical root, it has then a timestamp, beats, and then nonce. Okay. So this is uh, this is a Bitcoin header and, 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 and data fields and, and, and all about and, and their sizes. Now I will explain the rough mining process. Then it will be much more clearer. Okay, so mining process, how does this miner work really? So on a higher level, the process of mining boils down to these following steps. So this kind of, this looks like kind of more like an algorithmic steps. So let's take a look on the first step. So what the miner first does is this. From the network, they try to retrieve the previous block hash, okay, and the target. 
So of course you need to have the previous block because why? Because you know blockchain uh, it has to be chained uh, with the previous block. So miner has to gain uh, give, miner has to know what is the uh, hash of the previous block. So that's why uh, they need to collect that. Okay. And then they also need to, uh, you know, see the target or the difficulty level. Now, if I go back to the pre previous slide, these, these bits, bits, uh, this, this, this data field, this bits, encodes the network target level difficulty. So, so this is this in this piece of information. They needs to uh, the the miners need to gain, need to retrieve. Okay. So, so from the network, you know, a miner tries to get the previous block hash, and and then uh, then the target difficulty. They would they 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 try to retrieve. Okay. Then uh, they select or they collect the unconfirmed transactions. So basically they, they find the transactions. What are the transactions that have had taken place? Uh, they try to uh, you know, uh, take the uh, transactions and then bundle them together. So as you know that in each block, uh, you know, it, it might contain uh, many transactions. So miner, you know, definitely they, they collect all the transactions which are not confirmed yet. Uh, and, and then uh, they bundle them together in in the possible uh, candidate block uh, to be found to be found. Okay. So so far, what we have collected, we have collected the unconfirmed transactions, and then we have also collected uh, the previous block hash, and also we have collected uh, uh, the target difficulty. We means the miner. Sorry. So the miner has collected those. Okay. And then, yeah, then uh, it will also construct a new transaction, a coin-based transaction. Basically, this the reason here, uh, maybe I have not mentioned yet, that once a block is found, okay, once a miner finds a block, new money, new Bitcoin is created, okay? Uh, I don't really remember the exact amount uh, of, of Bitcoin creation per block, but maybe it's around six, six new Bitcoins are created, 6.25 or I don't really remember, but something like that. So that's why they construct this new transaction. So new transaction or new money created, new money has been created. So this information, uh, this miner creates. So. So we have these unconfirmed transactions where maybe I have paid Divya, Divya has paid uh, someone else. These confirmed, unconfirmed transactions, they, uh, the miners collect, but then the miner also uh, create a new transaction uh, that help to create new money, new Bitcoin, okay? So then what, it, what the miner does? The miner then calculate the Merkle root from the Coinbase transaction and the selected unconfirmed transactions. So in step two and three, we have now you know transactions, Coinbase transactions, new money creation transactions, transaction plus unconfirmed transactions. And the miners take these transactions and calculate the Merkle root. And how do they calculate the metrical root? You need to go back to the previous slide here. And this is how they create the Merkel root. Uh, the miner creates the Merkel root. So here, for example, here we have the unconfirmed transactions in block two. And hash is, uh, hash, hash is there when, when they have sent uh, the transaction. And, and, and then hash is created. And out of that Merkel root is created. So the miner creates the Merkel root. Okay, now let's go back. Yeah, so calculate the Merkle root of the coin-based transaction and selected transactions. So Merkle root is now created. And now the, yeah, the, now the thing is concatenate these values to create the block message. 
So we create now a block message. The miners create a block message. Out of what? Out of this Merkel root, out of this previous hash that, we, that, the, that the miner has uh, collected, out of the target level, uh, and so on. So all this information, um, maybe no, they, they, they don't take uh, the they, do, they don't take the target level uh, to create the message. Sorry, uh, they, they 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 basically take uh, take uh, the transactions, uh, so the Merkle root, and 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 the previous block uh, uh, to to create the block message. Okay, so then uh, the block message is created, and then they select a number for the nonce and append it to the message. So as I have told you that this nonce could be uh, 32 bytes. So this basically means uh, there could be two to the power 32, uh, uh, you know, num uh, different numbers, uh, any number between one to two to the power 32. So what, what the miner does, they take let's say one as nonce and append it to the block message to create the full candidate block header. They can also take two as nonce and then create uh, the, the full candidate uh, uh, block header. So let's assume that in nonce, they put the number one and then they append it to the block message. So basically they, they add it to the block message, and then the whole uh, kind of you know uh, you know block header is created, and then once the header is created, then the the, the miner performs this SHA two hundred fifty six function. You have learned about this SHA two hundred fifty six hash yesterday. So basically, they take the block message plus nonce together and then they create a hash out of it using SHA-256 algorithm, okay? And then it, it, it finds a hash value. And what it does then, it then uh, tries to compare with the network target. So remember in, in step one, uh, the miners, uh, uh, miners uh, you know, collected the network difficulty or target level. So after they create the hash, okay, then they compare with the, with this target value. And if, if the target value is, is, is satisfied, the block is valid. So yeah, so they have now got the block. If it satisfies. After the comparison, if, they, if it satisfies, then they find the block and, and, and the miner propagates it uh, to the network uh, and, and asks others to confirm, okay? Uh, but then if the block header hash does not satisfy the target, okay? Then the block is invalid, okay? And then miner needs to step to six, uh, go, go back to step six. So step six is, what is our step six? Step six is about trying a new nonce. Okay, so you remember the last time I told that here uh, for, you, you try with nonce one and then, and then you know, try to do it. But then next time you, you come here and try to use nonce two and do the whole process. Then if you find, good, you find, found, the, uh, found the block. If not, then again, go back to six and, and then try nonce three and then continue with the whole process. So this is a loop. And this loop can take place from one to two to the power 32 because nonce has a, uh, nonce has a, uh, what is this thing called? Nonce has a, uh, uh, you know, uh, field size of four bytes, uh, 32 bits. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, the whole mining process. 
So as you can see, it, it is quite computation oriented. You need to calculate SHA 256 several times, many times, and compare. So many things you need to do here. And again, also all the miners are trying to do the same thing and they are competing with each other. Uh, then the whole process, whole, this whole process, I try to explain it with this, with this uh, nice diagram. Uh, it will help you to understand even better. So basically uh, the thing that uh, you, you, have, you have seen in writing format in the previous, uh, previous uh, slide, uh, that's in, 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 flow, in the flowchart, uh, kind of flowchart here. So let's start from the beginning. So we have at the beginning, this start of construction of new block. So a miner starts to construct a new block. So what information first he needs to collect is first version. So he collects the version, okay? He runs a query to the chain, to the current chain to find the previous block hash. Yeah, I have already mentioned that you need to have the previous block hash Okay, what else you need? Uh, you also need to have this target or difficulty level. Yeah, so we could, we, uh, the miner target uh, we collects that. And also, you, the miner also collect this current epoch time or, or the current time it collects. Okay, and what else it needs to collect? It needs to collect uh, the in the, uh, the, the unconfirmed transactions uh, from the transaction pool, okay? Choose a set of transactions. Plus, as I mentioned, that for each block, new Bitcoin is created. So it needs also to build a coin-based transaction. In the previous slide, you have seen, okay? So these are the information you need to, uh, the miner needs to collect, uh, collect, okay? Now, the next step is to calculate the Merkel root. You could see the Merkel root is calculated based on this coin-based transaction and all the transactions that it has collected. Yeah, and how we have already shown it, creating the hash of hashes. Okay, and this is how the Merkel root is created. So the Merkel root contains information of all the transactions, including this Bitcoin, uh, sorry, coin-based transaction plus all the transactions that took place. Okay, so now we have uh, all the information like you know uh, version, we have uh, you know previous block hash, we have the uh, Merkel root, uh, Merkel root, we have the target level, and we have the epoch time. Now, what is my uh, now the next task is to create a message out of all these. Okay, so we create a message. So we are taking all these into account. Uh, see, Merkel root version, uh, previous block hash, uh, current time. We we basically you know uh, take everything into uh, into one place like in a concatenate uh, uh, to form the message to form the data, the overall data or overall header, okay? And then next one is you need to choose a nonce. So as I mentioned that let's try to choose, this is a loop. So you first start to choose a nonce of one and it can go up to two to the power 32. So this loop will run from one to two to the power 32, okay? So Let's take nonce one, and then what you do, you had the message M in the previous previous case, uh, in the previous step, you concatenate, uh, 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 concatenate uh, uh, the, this, the message with the nonce to create the header. As you see, header equal to M, and then concatenate with nonce, okay? So now you have created the full header, block header, but now, Next step is to perform SHA 256 algorithm uh, computation of this header. And in Bitcoin network, this is done twice, not once, but twice. 
to improve the security. Okay, so what it does is that first it creates SHA-256 of header and then it again creates SHA-256 of that hash and then finally get the hash. Okay, so two, two times 256, uh, SHA-256 is, is executed. And then, so if you, now you have the final hash and then now you need to compare if this final hash satisfy the target. So we collected this difficulty target level. And if yes, that, that, that then you found the block and you need to now, the, the miner needs to now uh, propagate uh, that you found the block to the network and, and the network will confirm. Uh, but then if it doesn't satisfy the target, then you go back to this nonce, increase the nonce, make the nonce two, three, four, five, and 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 go and loop, loop, make a loop like this until you find the uh, find the block. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the whole whole how the whole mining process uh, actually works. Uh, so at this moment, uh, I would also like still like to you know take a break because now. Well, I think I'm 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 talking almost now one and one one hour forty five minutes almost. So let's take a break of of again uh, ten minutes. So now, yeah. So let's start. I don't know what is the time in India now, uh, but yeah, what is the time in India? Can can anybody tell me? That is six forty evening. Okay, six four six forty. Or for or forty five. Forty three. Yeah, for yeah, for okay. So so let's let let's start uh, ex at at seven. Okay. So take a break. Grab a cup of coffee. So fifteen minutes break. Okay.
Okay, so I'm back. So, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. sir. Good. good, good. It was a very good break. I managed to eat some sandwiches. <clears throat> okay, so, uh, <clears throat> uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, these miners have to solve a cryptographic puzzle. And this is basically the puzzle that the miners need to choose a nonce and then uh, create uh, the uh, block header uh, out of uh, by, by merging the nonce and message, compute two times SHA-256 algorithm, check if it satisfies with the difficulty target. Uh, to target, uh, target difficulty. If not, try again. So this is the puzzle the miners try to solve. So that's why uh, when I was introducing what is, what is blockchain, uh, at that time I told that uh, miners have to solve a cryptographic puzzle. And this this all this whole uh, this mining process is also known as proof of work. Okay, so 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 far, any question from you? Very good. If no question, I I, I assume that you have understood uh, things uh, quite well, and. As I mentioned several times, uh, yesterday Dr. Divya gave you, you know, such, uh, you know, a foundation knowledge. Uh, I wasn't there whole time. I think I was there uh, maybe one and a half hour or so. And the knowledge was, you know, so much foundational. I was really happy to see that uh, today you will be able to understand uh, that today this content and you know the content that I will present later, uh, they will be easy to understand because you have got the solid foundation uh, given by Dr. Divya. But very good. Uh, then uh, we, we try to continue from here. So about uh, this uh, smart contract, uh, yeah, we have already learned about it, but uh, I don't know why I included it again here. I don't really remember, but but anyway, so smart contracts, uh, we have already learned that it's they are just simply computer programs, a piece of codes uh, that are executed, that are executed uh, when predefined uh, you know, uh, conditions are met and the actions are also uh, predefined. Uh, so I gave the example that I'm um, you know, making a contract with, uh, with the company uh, energy company and whenever the price goes down to four cents uh, basically my contract will be will be executed so that's kind of you know the contract uh, you already know about it but then uh, the interesting thing is consensus algorithm and this consensus refers to the to a system uh, of ensuring that the parties agree to a certain state uh, of the system as the true state so basically the, the idea is same, uh, like in the, in, the, in the mining process. So what we have there, like they are trying to solve a, a puzzle and then after, after kind of, you know, solving the puzzle, uh, uh, the miner sends it to the network to confirm. And this process, in this process, uh, the, the, the miners or the nodes uh, decide uh, if a block block needs to be added or the transaction needs to be added to the block or not. So this, this whole process is called this consensus algorithms. But uh, the previous slide that we have seen, this is uh, basically for Bitcoin and, 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 and so it is for proof of work uh, uh, consensus algorithm. But there are some other consensus algorithms such as proof of authority, and then uh, proof of stake, and we will uh, briefly learn about those uh, in, 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 in the coming lectures. So, but anyway, 
Okay, so this is uh, about uh, smart contracts and, and consensus algorithms, uh, which would be, uh, which are kind of, you know, the foundation of, of blockchain. Uh, now, I would like to give uh, a very practical example of how blockchain works. But uh, be, before that, uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, you have learned uh, about this hash function functions yesterday. But maybe you know I, I try to explain it in a bit different way, so that you know at least uh, there are many people here who are coming from business background and and also uh, uh, in, in law background. So maybe it would be much easier for them uh, to understand because hash is really important in, in, in blockchain. So we need to really understand the, the, the hash. Uh, so the hash, uh, what is hash? So hash uh, is, uh, is an output, uh, for example, in case of uh, Ethereum or in case of Bitcoin, uh, the output of SHA-256 function. Now, uh, of course, you know, there are some computer scientists here and maybe you are expert in security. Uh, you probably uh, you know, know already uh, much about SHA 256 algorithm, how does it work and so on. But, uh, but I don't think it is uh, very much necessary uh, to understand the inner algorithm of SHA 256. Uh, so for the business people, I would like to mention uh, that just think that SHA-256 is a black box. Think that is a black box. And if you give an input to this black box, you get an output from that black box. Okay, let's just forget about what is happening in SHA-256. So just think about, think it as a black box, as a, as a black box function. So if you give an input, let's say whatever, then it will give you an output of fixed length, okay? Even though the length of the data varies. So let's assume that you put your name to this black box called SHA-256. Let's say that I put my name, Nazmul, and it will give me uh, some 64 uh, bits, uh, 64 characters of, of, of output. That is the hashed output. That is the hash. Okay. Uh, that is the hash of my name, Nazmul. Okay. But then you try to add Nazmul Islam. Still, you see, you will see that the hash is still, uh, you know, the length of the hash remains is still same, 64 characters. Although you have kind of uh, you have you have added this Islam on top of uh, Nazmul, but still uh, the length of the characters will be same. Uh, of course, the number will, uh, the, the value will vary, but the length will be fixed. Here is an example I have given. So I was teaching this course uh, in, 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 in my university and I have a course named called, you know, this uh, course uh, called Business Strategy and Digital Economy. So what I did, I put this uh, text, business strategy and digital economy, this text into this SHA-256 function or to SHA-256 uh, black box function, okay? And uh, I put it as an input and then I got an output of 64 characters and that looks like this. 4CCC, uh, 4CC, 71B00 and so on. So if you count, it will be 64 characters, okay? Then what I did is that I changed the input value a little bit. So in the red text, you could see that I have used a comma there. So after business strategy, I have put a comma, and then the rest of the things remain as same, like and digital economy. So business strategy, comma, which is the new addition and digital economy I put, and then it calculated a new hash. And you, as you see, now the hash begins with B320434. 
and, and so on. Now, now if you compare between these two hashes, the first hash uh, without comma and the second hash with comma, you could say that the hash is completely different. Completely different. So you just changed a, a small character, just comma. Even, even if you just give one more white space, still the hash will change. But what is interesting here, that, that the hash uh, length remains same, 64 characters. Okay. Now let's take a look uh, uh, on the third instance. Uh, here uh, in the text, uh, I have written that uh, business strategy and digital economy is an important course for DT, means digital transformation major. Now I put this whole text uh, in, uh, to this SHA 256 function. And based on that, as you could see, I have got again a completely new hash. So I have added quite a bit of text like is an important course of for DT major, but it's still the hash length remains same, 64 characters, and also it changes completely. So the point here, you could give whatever input. You could give, let's say, the whole website of Gian page a whole website of GAN, and still you will have this 64 character output as the hash of all the information that GAN page contains. Okay? So that's kind of, you know, the concept of uh, hash and, uh, and its output. Yeah. Okay, so now I will I will show you some practical examples. Uh, uh, you can uh, you can go to these websites if you want, but I think it's more important to take a look on the screen. Uh, these these websites could be shared later, but but I think uh, just take a look on 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 the screen on the on my screen. I will now stop sharing uh, this screen and I will share. Uh, a new screen uh, within uh, within few seconds. Okay, uh, can you see my new screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, very good. So, so as I was uh, showing you in the in the in the PowerPoint slide uh, about this SHA two hundred and fifty six function. Okay, now let's. So now here you have two fields. One is data field and then one is hash field. So whatever data you put here, corresponding hash will be calculated here. So in this website, they have implemented this two, uh, SHA 256 algorithm, okay? So now even you, you could see that the data is completely white, there is nothing there, but it's still for white information, no information, still there is a hash and let's put something here and I just put one dot and the hash changes I put another dot you see completely different uh, hash is computed just changing uh, uh, although I just put on one dot one extra dot if I put let's say on white space again still you see that uh, it is completely changed. I put another white space, you see, still uh, the hash is completely changed. So 
the thing here is that what remains uh, stable is the length. So always, whatever I have done so far here, you see, whatever I do here, it is changing, but the length remains same. Okay. So here we could write my name or we could include uh, many transactions like Nazmul pays uh, Divya 10 euros and so on. And we could include hundreds, thousands of, of, of information here and you will ultimately get a hash out of all your data. Okay. So now I think it is it is now quite quite clear. I think that uh, how how this hash, uh, like you know that that the hash always uh, provides you uh, kind of a fixed length uh, uh, character uh, list, uh, and and it changes uh, it changes even if you put uh, you make slight changes. So that's all about uh, this 256 uh, hash. Now let's take this hash concept a bit further, a bit further, which is about block. Okay, now uh, here you see uh, the whole concept of block, uh, or not really the whole concept, but you know, some elements of block, uh, con some, some concept, some elements or block is there. So at least here you could see uh, that the block, uh, you have a block number and you have nonce. And we have learned about nonce. So just to remind, what was nonce? So nonce is the number uh, with which the data is merged together to calculate a hash and compare it to the network target level. Remember the, the, the algorithm, if you think about the Bitcoin algorithm. So nonce is the number which is, which is concatenated or merged with the data or, or the list of transactions, okay? A list of transactions, including the Coinbase new money creation transactions and then together they create the hash and then it, com it is compared with, uh, with the target, okay? So that is the same concept here. So let's assume that we have some data here, uh, but, but, but just before that, you could see here, uh, this color means this block is valid, okay? And, and you could see that although here we had, when we calculated some hash, we didn't have, you know, we had, uh, our hash was starting from seven uh, and or, or, you know, different numbers, but not with four zero zero zero, uh, sorry, with not, uh, with not four zero, but you could see that it is starting with different numbers. But here, when you look at the, uh, at the block, then you could see, the hash is hash is starting with some different numbers like with numbers like four zeros and this is kind of the predefined structure of the blockchain that the hash has to be the calculated hash has to be uh, like this that there should start with four zero eight zero or whatever they have the different network could have different requirements Okay, so the target here is basically, you need to, if I translate the Bitcoin algorithm here, the target here is that you need to come up with, or the miners need to come up with a hash that starts with four zero, taking the data and nonce into account. And if you can do that, then you are successful in mining the mining the block. So that's kind of the concept here. So now let's take a look here. Uh, now, if I add some data here, 
Now you could add any data. And when I add, added the data, you see it became uh, invalid. The color has changed. The pink color shows this is invalid. And then if we look at the hash is also changed and it is not anymore uh, the hash that begins with four zeros. Okay. So now we need to mine it or the miners need to mine it. And just remember the mining process. How does the miner mine it? It changes the norms, right? It changes the norms and then tries to, uh, you know, take a look at the, at, the, at the requirement. And if it satisfied the requirements, then it is mined. So what it does basically, it, uh, the miner starts, let's say, with, with let's say, nonce one. And you see, we have, when we put nonce one, we got a hash like this, but it still, it doesn't fulfill the requirement. The requirement is that the hash should be starting with four zeros. So the, so the miner then tries with this, put, in, put here two, and then say, no, it doesn't work. It's still, it, it is starting with four, that's why F, so let's try three. No, it is still doesn't work. It, it basically, because the hash still begins with two. So it has to begin with four zero. Let's try four. Let's try five and so on. So the miner tries to do this exercise. This, this puzzle the miner tries to solve. And as I mentioned in the case of Bitcoin, the norms could be any number from 1 to 2 to the power 32. So if I now, let's say that I, if I now click here, mine, what will happen? The miner will start to compute, to match, uh, so to try different norms, and then try to compare the hash, and then try to validate the block. Let's take a look, I click here and keep an eye on the on the nonce field and also the hash field, okay? So now you see in the nonce field, we have number five and in the hash field, we have uh, two. Now let me click here. And now it is mining. So basically it is trying different combinations of nonce and data. And then after trying so many times, it found that when the nonce is this number, uh, 408316, then if they concat this number with this data field, then the hash they compute satisfy the network. And you see here, four zeros is that uh, we have found uh, 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 the hash that, that basically satisfies the network. So that is the concept here. Okay. So this is this is now block. Uh, so in the block we have a block num block number, uh, and then nonce and the data and hash. And you kind of now got the basic idea of mining, uh, you know, mining of mining uh, a block through this uh, through this exercise through this demo. Okay. Okay. So now we know how to how to uh, get a block, how to mine a block, but still it is not enough because we need to chain it together to make it blockchain. Okay. So let's come here, uh, and here you could see uh, that we have now instead of one block we have now several blocks. Block one, block two, block three, block four, and block five. So we have five blocks here, okay? And naturally, uh, uh, the difference here that we have you know, more blocks here uh, in compared to the previous, uh, previous one that we have more blocks here. In addition to that, we see that in each block, we have a separate field data field called previous, prev or previous block, okay? 
So uh, let's say that in block two, we have a previous block. Okay. And the previous blocks uh, hash uh, is, uh, is uh, 40, 000, 1578. And if you compare this hash with block one's hash, it's the same. So this is basically the same thing that I gave, uh, I, I showed you an example that each block basically refers to the previous block. So, so block two's hash is the same hash as block one's hash. Block three's previous hash is the same hash as block two's hash and so on. Okay, so now you could see that there is a chain here. Okay, so blockchain is here. Now, now, as I mentioned that when the color is like this, it means that uh, the blocks are valid, they are mined, and, and they are okay. But let's try to do some edits. Let's say that I am an attacker, and I would like to change some data uh, in, in, in these blocks one of these blocks, okay? So let's try that I would like to change something in the block five, so here. So in block five, I say that, you know, I would write my name. So as soon as I have written my name or, you know, did any change, it turned pink, so be, because it turned invalid. Okay, so basically it, it, it turned completely invalid. Now, if you mine it, let's try to mine it, then it will be again valid. Okay, so if you are doing some changes here at the final block, so only the, last, the final last block is going to be invalid, okay? But that means that you just need to again mine this particular block. All other blocks remain intact, okay? But, but if let's say I'm an attacker and I want to change the block one, and here I would like I would like to put my name. And if I put my name here, you see, all the blocks then becomes invalid. Everything becomes invalid. If you look at the hash, look at this hash, they don't satisfy the condition. And our condition was that it has to be four zeros. First, take a look at block two's hash. It, it, it doesn't start with four zeros anymore. It, Three block three has same thing. It doesn't start with like that, and so on. Okay. So now, in order to tackle this, if I am an attacker, I need to again mine all these blocks. So I need to mine first this block. Okay. Now it is mined, and again you see. Uh, this hash starts now with four zeros, or not four zeros, but five zeros, sorry. Normally, I, I, I told it wrong. Uh, it is, it is, uh, the condition is five zeros. But, but if you could see uh, the, also the nonce is changed. Uh, of course, we have learned that, uh, you know, when the data is changed, it has to recompute the whole thing. Yeah. So when I click here, then I mine this one. Uh, then I mine this one. I mine this one. And then I have to mine this one. Maybe there is some problem in the code here. Oh no, it's, it's okay. Uh, it is also starts with uh, five zeros. Yeah. So, so now it's again, again fully, fully mined. So what, 
we learn from here is that it is it is uh, a bit easy if you if an attacker change something in the last block last last mine block uh, then uh, you just need to remind uh, the, 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 the 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 only block that one but if something is changed on the older blocks then the uh, full blockchain has to be remind so we can say uh, that the older blocks are more secure than the new than, than the newest block. Okay, so this is a kind of the concept of of, of blockchain. But but now uh, let's now take a look at this distributed part. Now. We learned that well uh, in the previous uh, previous one that uh, previous demo that you know uh, you know one computer uh, could have uh, could could store the blockchain, but in fact, as we know, that blockchain is a, a distributed uh, ledger, so there needs to be uh, many peers or many computers, many nodes in the network, and in this example you kind of see the same thing here you see uh, you have this pair a and this pair a contains uh, a blockchain uh, that contains these five blocks okay and they are mined and uh, based on the color you could say that they are they are valid blocks then if you come down then you see we have a PRB, another another node, and uh, this node has also you know same blocks, same data. If you compare, you know they have the identical data. Basically, as you know that all PR will have the identical data. So the, he has all also the same blockchain, same data, nothing changed. Okay, uh, previous hash, hash, everything just similar. Then we have another mind, another another peer, uh, peer C. He has also the same thing. Okay. So let's assume that we have three three peers. Okay. Now, uh, what we do? Let's assume that peer A uh, is an, uh, he decided that you know he needs wants to change something in the blockchain. So definitely he can change. He tries to change and his block uh, remains invalid uh, because of you know nonce and, 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 and new data. Of course, he can remind this and then he can pretend that his data is valid. You know, at least uh, look at this not based on the color. Uh, it seems that his data is valid. But, but here the thing is that as we have many peers like this, PRB, PRC, PRD, PRE, and so many commerce, so many nodes are there. So they don't necessarily would like to change this data. So they will keep the same data, uh, the original data. And so the network will understand, or the network will now decide that whose data is valid. So and they they kind of see that okay only PRA has done you know this modification and rest of the people rest of the things uh, rest of the uh, people are have uh, peers have have you know identical data so uh, we have to uh, discard these guys uh, this PRA's changes okay so this is how you know even if one minor behaves abnormally still the blockchain remains intact because because of this uh, this 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 thing that all other peers all peers have have, have different uh, have the same data set and at the very beginning we were discussing about the uh, you know benefits of distributed ledger and you can see the direct benefit here that if one data is corrupted one, one, well, you know, there still you have other, other peers and the system runs. Okay, so this is uh, kind of, you know, the uh, concept 
concept of distributed blockchain that I wanted to uh, share. And then let's take a look then at tokens. Now, uh, the thing is that uh, so far, uh, we have, uh, you know, had data, uh, we could, we had the field, you know, open field data, and we could add anything to the data space. But how about if we, if we include transactions inclu instead of data? So here, you could see that we have, you know, again, uh, several peers, peer A, peer B, peer C. Okay, and they, they hold the same, they have you know, five, five blocks and, 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 and the blocks are valid. Based on the color, you could see the blocks are valid. Okay. Now, here you see that we still have nones and then previous, uh, previous hash and hash, we all, everything we have like, the, like before. But now the data field now changed to some uh, transactions. Now the transactions, you could see that uh, first transaction is about in block one is Darcy to Bingley. Uh, Darcy is sending uh, twenty-five dollar to Bingley, and then you could see you know many many transactions like this. Okay, and as you see, one very important concept here uh, that uh, we I, I mentioned uh, before that a block. It is not that a block will always contain a fixed number of transactions. Here you could see that the blocks contain different number of transactions. Uh, the first block contains uh, five transactions, where the second block contains three, six, eight transactions, and the third block only three transactions. Okay, and the concept is basically same: that if you do some changes, it becomes invalid, and everything becomes invalid. And it works, you know, exactly same way, the way that I, I basically described. Okay, but here you could see instead of uh, instead of uh, you know some some data, uh, we are we are dealing with uh, transactions. Okay, but the other other concepts uh, remain same. Yeah. Okay, but then. We will see the next uh, example now, which is about this. Now, the, the question is, sometimes the question is that, well, uh, let's take a look at the previous example. Uh, so here, uh, Darcy is uh, sending, uh, you know, being late $25 in block one. But the question remains that does Darcy really have $25? So somehow the history need to be checked. Okay. So this is then this, you know, this Coinbase uh, example that in block one, there is a Coinbase transaction. So basically Coinbase transaction means that new money is created. So Anders have got $100. Okay. So Anders got hundred dollars, and this is the only transaction which is included in block one. And in block two, Anders started to spend the money. So Anders sent ten dollars to Sophia, uh, twenty dollars to Lucas, and so on. So, but from here, you could see if if Anders really have hundred dollars or not so this this kind of thing it is it is basically you know you know showing that you can you can always you know go back and and see whether uh, really uh, really this this guy has has the money to spend or not and the rest of the concepts uh, remain basically uh, same okay now we have a separate example, which is about public key and private key. Can you see uh, my my uh, uh, my uh, screen where it is showing public slash private key pairs? Yes, sir. Okay, very good. 
Okay, so here you see we have this public key private key pair. So just as the name suggests uh, that uh, uh, that uh, private key is private to you and public key is public to everyone. Now I should go back to the previous example and tell you one thing. Now so far in, in, in different, uh, in my lecture, you have found that instead of this type of transactions, uh, like, you know, this Anders uh, sends money, $10 to Sophia, you have seen that there is, instead of this kind of transactions, you see some kind of signature. Uh, so how to create that signature? How does, how to make sure that it is indeed Anders who has sent the money to Sophia? So some kind of signature, Anders has to sign it somehow to make, to make sure so that Sophia can can check if it is Anders who has sent them money. Okay, and so that's why we need so we need this cryptography, and that brings me to talk about this public key private key cryptography. Okay, so private key is private. To individual like me, me, for example, and public key is something that you can share with publicly, publicly. Okay. Uh, now, and they they are pair basically. So let's see. Let's see if I change this number. Here, here we have four at the end. If I change this number to to let's say five. And then you see your private key, sorry, your public key is also changing. So I'm, I'm, I'm reducing the size of the public private key and, and also the public key is changing. They work like a pair, okay? So, so private key is for your private use and public key is for your, uh, is, for your uh, is, is, is to tell everyone. So, and they work like a pair. And each private key has a corresponding public key, as you see here. So I'm changing it, and I'm getting a new public key each time. Okay? So this is the concept of public key and private key pairs. But now we'll learn why it is important, why it is necessary. Of course, you have already learned it uh, theoretically uh, yesterday, but let's take a look on this demo. Uh, so here, here uh, for example, I have uh, written here, uh, uh, Divya, I have written Divya, uh, that, hello Divya, how are you? Okay, so this is my message, and I want to send it to Divya. And this is my uh, private key, okay? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to encrypt this message with my private key, so when I will basically uh, sign, put a sign, put sign here, click sign here, I will create a message signature. So basically, I will I will basically uh, encrypt uh, my message uh, with my private key. So let's click here, and it basically give gave, gave me a signature value. You see, this is you know some some big number. So what I have really done, I took the message, hello Dibia, how are you? And I applied my private key, and then, you know, I did some computation and, uh, and, and this, you know, and so on. And then I got, I got a message signature, and this is my message signature, okay? And I sent this message to Divya. okay? Now, on the, on the receiving end, Divya is there, so let's try to verify. So let's say that Divya want wants to verify whether it is indeed me, whether it is Nazbul, indeed me, who sent him this message or not. Whether it is indeed me 
who is, uh, whether it is indeed me who has who has signed this message or not okay so as said that my public key is known so Divya knows my public key okay and this is the corresponding uh, public key uh, of my private key so I didn't share my private key but the, I have shared my public key with Divya for example okay and here I have sent the message and I have also sent the signature okay now what Divya will do so Divya knows my public key he will use my public key to check if this message is indeed sent by me or not or is it is it indeed signed by me or not so with the help of this public key uh, he can do it so here when we will click here to verify and it will be verified it is verified so basically you could see that yeah uh, with this color you could see that yes this is the thing uh, this is uh, this is indeed sent by Nasbul to Divya. But let's think that we are, you know, somehow the public key wrong. So I just change the public key. If you try to verify here, then click verify, and you see, it's not, it's not anymore valid. Okay. So this is the concept of public key, private key, and then creating signature. Okay. And in blockchain or in Bitcoin or in any, any, in any blockchain, basically each of the transactions or each of the data are signed by uh, the sender or the creator. So let's say, let's say if I send, if I send Vivia $10, what I will do is that I will and I will use my private key to sign and then I will send it to the network okay and here you will see this same this thing so let's assume that I want to send $20 to Divya. Now, so we what we do basically in, in, in Bitcoin is that we share the public key and public key is our basically is our address. Is our address. It's like the bank account or Bitcoin address. Public key are Bitcoin addresses. Okay, so here you see, for example, me and Divya are both have, we both have uh, Bitcoin addresses or Bitcoin wallet, or you could say a Bitcoin account if it is easy to understand. Okay, we both have Bitcoin account. Okay. So if we have both have Bitcoin account, then me and Asmul will have two keys. One would be my private key and public key. Second one is public key. And Divya will also have his private key and public key. The private key it would be private to me, but then the public key is basically my Bitcoin address. So I have a Bitcoin address then, which is my public key, and Divya has a Bitcoin address, which is Divya's uh, public key, okay? So now instead of, you know, putting name like Nazmul transferring money, uh, $20 to, to, to Divya, uh, we write here uh, kind of uh, our addresses or the, our public key. So for example, me, I'm Nazmul, I'm sending, uh, I, I, I wrote my uh, public key here or Bitcoin address here and uh, I wrote uh, B, uh, Bitcoin address of Divya here. So here is the sender, here is the receiver, okay? 
And then I wrote that, well, I will uh, transfer $20, uh, okay, to the villa. And this is my uh, private key, which I don't share. So I basically, what I will do, I will sign it with my private key. Let me sign it. And then I create, I have created a, a message signature. So this whole, uh, whole message signature is created here, okay? On the receiving end, end or in the network, let's take a look on the verify, okay? And here you see what we have here. Uh, so when the network sees or DBS sees it, what, what he will do, he has received the message, the signature, it has received the signature, and it, 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 you can see, uh, you know, the account number, or sorry, or, or the Bitcoin address, uh, my Bitcoin address, which is my public key. And what he will just do is just click here, verify, and then it will be verified. So basically, if uh, uh, with, with my public key, uh, Divya or the network can verify that it is indeed me who has sent the money, and it is indeed me who has actually $20 to be sent. Yeah, so this is uh, the example of, uh, you know, a one, one small uh, transaction. Uh, that, and now the whole thing together, how does it look like if you think about blockchain? So this is, uh, well, this example, this is, uh, you know, kind of uh, the whole example of blockchain. So we have, seen so many uh, demos uh, so far, but this is probably uh, the closest demo uh, uh, with the actual uh, Bitcoin or, or, or how, how actually, you know, blockchain works. So, as you see here, now in block one, okay, so here you see again, you know, you have three pairs, uh, pair A, pair B, pair C, and each pair has, you know, different blocks, you know, five blocks are there. And here you see nonce is there, we know about it. And then you could see that $100 is transferred to this account, this Bitcoin address, which is the public key. So here you could see, uh, instead of names, we basically use uh, the public key, uh, public key or Bitcoin addresses. So hundred dollars is created and sent it to uh, this uh, this address, okay. And this block has been mined. Then in block in block two, what you could see here, this is quite interesting here now. In block two, what you see, uh, see that this TX part, this transaction part, here you see instead of names, we have this you know. Uh, public key addresses or, block, uh, or Bitcoin addresses, that's from, from this Bitcoin address to this Bitcoin address, send $10, okay? And what you really see here, this signature. So what this guy is doing, so this guy is using, you know, suppose that this is me, so I am using my private key to sign it and create this signature. I'm creating this signature and I am sending this signature. $10 from address to address. This is my, 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 my uh, public key and I have my uh, private key which I have not shared with anyone. With that private key, I, I create this transaction's signature and so on. And for this is also the case for all other transactions. So you see that why this signature thing is very important. So at the very beginning, we, we have learned about, you know, this uh, public key, private key and transferring the message and, and so on. And, 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 and you have also seen that in, in the medical tree that actually it is the uh, signature that is, that is stored uh, in the blockchain. So, so that's why it is very important to create the, the, the signature. Okay, so here, uh, now, now I will give you an example, another example.
example, another interesting things thing, pipe. Okay. Now let's assume that uh, that you know an attacker want to change this this for this for this transaction instead of seven dollar he wants to make 7.10 an attacker came and did this okay so as usual uh, as like before you see the 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 block became uh, invalid and we have seen this in the past but on top of that another thing happened take a look at this this has also become invalid this has become red so attacker actually doesn't have the access to your if he somehow he, uh, he gets it then he can make this uh, this signature normal correct but if you have not shared with this this attacker then if you if he tries to change this data he will not be able to change the signature Okay. Uh, of course, you know, the miner, when the miner sees it, the miner can still, if you mind, press mine, they, they can probably, they can still mine the block. Let's take some time. Uh, it's mining. Let's see what happens. Yeah. So the miner was able to mine it but you see still uh this this now uh, uh this this is invalid and why it is invalid because your private key is not known by anyone yeah so now you could see what kind of security is there in this bitcoin or in blockchain we have this we have so many hashes we are trying to calculate basically each transaction is signed first with the private key okay and then we are calculating the merkel root okay we are linking it with with the previous block we are mining it we are we are we are you know kind of uh, you know solving this this cryptographic puzzle so all these things make bitcoin or or blockchain in general uh, very difficult uh, to attack and and change and it, it is immutable as you have seen that it is immutable it can once the data is there no one can change Okay, so this is kind of uh, about about the practicalities of a uh, uh, practical example of uh, of blockchain of, of how blockchain works in general, and then I would go back to my slide again, uh, and so we have now covered. Uh, can you see my slides now? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so so these two things now I have I have covered, and now I would like to still continue a bit, maybe fifteen more minutes, uh, and then I will introduce you uh, one exam, uh, one 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 classroom uh, on exercise that you need to do in groups. Uh, Yeah, uh, it seems that I have quite many things. Yeah, it, I think I think I think uh, I will need much more time. So today we have we have basically done uh, four hours. So let's not continue anymore because. I was thinking that I will give you one assignment for tomorrow, but it seems uh, I need to cover quite a bit of 
quite a bit of material uh, to go to that point. So let's not uh, do that uh, tomorrow. So tomorrow we will start again. And then maybe tomorrow I will introduce you to this group work. Yeah, so any questions so far? Okay, it seems there are no, no questions. No. Uh, was, the, was it very difficult? Tell me, was it very difficult? Especially for the students, uh, for those who are coming from, let's say, uh, 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 let's, is there, sir, there is a small question. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please uh, go ahead. Uh, just a bit about. I, I want. This is, just want to know the how how can we define this uh, Coinbase transaction? I just want to know uh, in a very simple manner. Yeah, uh, Coinbase transaction. Uh, the way I see it, uh, it is uh, the new money creation. Okay. So you need, you know that uh, I will I will show you example uh, tomorrow uh, with this actual Bitcoin uh, transaction data. Okay. You will see uh, that that after each uh, uh, mining each block, there is a block reward, or meaning that new money is created, and that basically you know uh, a Coinbase uh, transaction we can call. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any any more question? Or or if I go back to my previous Hi, question. Uh, sorry. Mm, hello, sir. I have a question. Yes. Am I audible, yes. sir? Yes, yes. Uh, sir, in blockchain systems, uh, sir, in blockchain systems, we have connect the same uh, uh, configurations of the block in series. Or we will just uh, uh, having a uh, much more uh, much more chance to connect the different uh, types of blockchains during the uh, storage. Suppose we have connect 32 bits and uh, the 32 bits is again connected, or maybe the we will having the uh, uh, another opportunity to connect 64 bytes or maybe 128 bytes during the same chain. Yeah, I think uh, if I have understood correctly your question, I think. Uh, we will cover these things later, but for your information, is that uh, this block header, uh, you see uh, the block header that I, okay, why was that block header? Yeah, so this is a kind of, uh, this is fixed, so you cannot change, this is predefined thing. However, however, the, there are some things uh, later uh, got updated to solve the, uh, solve the scalability problem. Uh, for example, in Bitcoin, uh, you know, it is very slow. So then the open source community thought that we need to somehow increase the size of each block, or we need to somehow uh, put some information in the side chain. Uh, so these kind of changes uh, took place, and due to these reasons, there have been many splits. So if you know uh, the original uh, Bitcoin, uh, which is known as BTC, later uh, was splitted into Bitcoin Cash, and then later became uh, also also it had uh, 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 Bitcoin Gold. So so yeah, so these these values. Uh, are not changeable. Uh, it, it goes to this open source community, and if they decide to change, uh, uh, sometimes you know change happens. Uh, but then again, uh, sometimes also uh, the communities disagree among each other. So then this kind of split happens that a group of community thinks that we will just keep the same thing. Uh, same same Bitcoin, the Satoshi Nakamoto's Bitcoin, and then some group thinks that well, no, we will uh, do it in such a way so that consumers can can adopt it. We will change you know the block size, we'll change uh, you know the other 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 values. We will change the uh, change the whole uh, kind of uh, this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, proof of work algorithm or or consensus algorithm. Uh, so. You know, different opinions are there, and that's why you will see different, uh, you know, uh, different uh, block Bitcoin versions also.
So I think I don't know if I have under uh, you, I have, I have uh, answered your question or not, but yeah, they are changeable, but it depends. Uh, depends. Yes, yeah. Yes, sir. I sir, bit uh, bit torrent uh, uh, chain is one of the example of this. Listen, uh, which one? If I think so. Uh, which one? Uh, bit torrent chain. Bit torrent chain. BTC chain. Okay, I don't know about that uh, because I have not been really following this Bitcoin development. I followed it until 2018. So when the price was really high, uh, 2018 when it, it went to $20,000, and then it, it, it went so down that I, I, I stopped you know, following uh, Bitcoin development. So since then, I do not really know what kind of development they have made. Yeah, so it could be that that there is, what you are saying is 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 also is correct, uh, but I know this Bitcoin Cash is one and Bitcoin Gold is one. Yeah, any any more yes, questions? Yes, thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. So if there are no more questions, uh, Dr. Divya, are you with us still? Divya, are you there? Mm -mm. I don't know. Divya, can you hear me? Okay, if not, it's not a problem. Uh, it's not a problem. Uh, so I would like to, you know, thank everybody and 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 today we have done uh, more than you know four hours. Uh, thank which you is so great. Much, sir. Thank you so much. And sir. tomorrow, yeah, tomorrow we will start where we left or left today. Thank you very much for listening, and take care. Thank and see you thank tomorrow. You, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you, sir. Hello, uh, will anyone please uh, tell me uh, how our attendance will be recorded? Hello. Yes, hello. Yes. Uh... Uh, actually, uh, Dr. Tevya took the uh, attendance just at the last moment yesterday. So I'm still waiting for him to. Uh, yeah, I'm here. Sir. Please let me know. What? Hello. Hello. Yes. Am I audible? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Audible. Please let me know. Well, is there any problem? No, I'm, I'll just. Amitesh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So have you marked the attendance today? So I have downloaded the attendance list. Okay, fine, sir. And in the meantime, uh, actually, we we used to take snapshots also fine, to mark sir. the attendance. So uh, there is one uh, announcement that. Uh, we have uh, assignments and quizzes. So um, I will I'm sending the link to the quiz one to your mailbox that quiz will start at 815 and will end at 820. Okay. Okay, that is tomorrow morning, sir. No, no, today. Okay, today. Oh, okay, okay, fine. Just uh, give us a moment. Sure. So uh, we will give um, you will you will get two links. One is for quiz and uh, one is for assignment. So assignment is due in two days. Okay. You have to submit the assignment in two days. Or um, let us um, uh, let us have the time of uh, the quiz by eight thirty. Okay. Fine. Okay. So. Um, uh, you will receive the link 
Uh, just give me a moment.
हेलो सर यस प्लीज इज इज शेड्यूल एट विच टाइम एट थर्टी ओके सर थैंक यू यू विल रिसीव द ईमेल वी आर ड्राफ्टिंग द ईमेल रिगार्डिंग द क्विज एंड असाइनमेंट यू विल रिसीव दैट मेल शॉर्टली ओके जस्ट बी आर विद अस फॉर फ्यू टाइम इफ एनी पार्टिसिपेंट हैज एनी एक्सपीरियंस you please uh, state your experience or uh, state your query regarding the today's uh, uh, lecture material or uh, lecture knowledge that you have gained